Fixed Postal Service Reform. Postmaster General Marvin Runyon and Postal Rate Commission Chairman Edward Gleiman testified today before a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee. Republican Congressman John McHugh chaired this three-hour hearing. Good afternoon. If we could uh, have the subcommittee uh, come to order, please. Well, let me welcome you all here. Uh, we have a standing room only crowd. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I guess that's why we're here today, to find out what that means. But I'm pleased that you're all able to join with us this afternoon. As I'm sure most of How about that? I just said wonderful things about the audience and you didn't hear it. Well, you all know you're great people, so I won't repeat it. Uh, today marks the first of a series of four legislative hearings on H.R. 3717, the Postal Reform Act of 1996. And I, first off, uh, beyond welcoming our audience today, of course, want to extend our greetings and best wishes and thanks to our witnesses today, our primary witnesses, uh, Mr. Runyon, and Mr. Gleiman, Mr. Runyon, the Postmaster General of the United States, of course, is accompanied uh, by Deputy Postmaster General Michael Kovlin and Senior Vice President and General Counsel Mary Elcano. Uh, both witnesses, uh, of course, are familiar faces before this subcommittee, and I extend our welcome uh, uh, for their appearance here today, and certainly we look forward to their testimony. I also want to note that uh, when Mr. Gleiman uh, takes the chair. Uh, he will not be joined at the table, but in the room are all of the members, I understand, of the Postal Rate Commission, and we are honored by their presence here today and thank them for their ongoing efforts uh, in helping to administer what I know most of us, if not all of us, agree is the most uh, effective uh, and efficient postal service found anywhere in the world. The Postal Reform Act 1996 represents the first significant effort at reforming the Postal Service since it was inaugurated 25 years ago this month. Since the inception of the 104th Congress, this subcommittee has heard from more than 60 witnesses regarding the need for what they perceive certainly to be significant changes to the current structure of the Postal Service. In addition, I've had the opportunity to meet with postal customers, employees, and some of our nation's business leaders regarding the need for such reform. H.R. 3717 represents these conversations and is intended to address many of the significant issues raised by postal stakeholders. I believe the Postal Re Reorganization Act of 1970 was largely successful in turning around a debt-ridden organization one that was dependent upon taxpayer dollars for its operating revenues. However, the communications environment in which the Postal Service finds itself today has changed dramatically in this interim. In 1970, few could have foreseen the explosion of personal computers, the internet, and fax machines as methods of personal communication. I believe the Postmaster General, Mr. Runyon, has correctly forecasted that unless changes are made in the act, the Postal Service could find itself in a communications company bound by outdated legislative constrictions and simply unable to compete. Our first panelist this afternoon is Postmaster General Marvin Runyon. As I noted, it was Mr. Runyon's clarion call for reform which initiated this legislative process. Many of the reforms sought by the Postmaster General are contained in 3717, including the ability to offer postal customers volume discounting, the unilateral ability to offer new products, and significant flexibilities in determining postal rates. While Mr. Runyon may have begun this process, the ball is now in our court, the Congress, to complete the mission. I look forward to the Postmaster General's statement as an effort to continue the progress we have made thus far. Sub Subcommittee also welcomes, as I noted earlier, Postal Rate Commission Chairman Ed Gleiman, accompanied by the members of the Rate Commission. H.R. 3717 confers significant new oversight responsibilities to the Rate Commission while transforming its function from rate setting to that of true regulator. 
Some in the postal community have urged the subcommittee to dismantle, to disband this agency. However, given the pricing authorities and other flexibilities contained in this bill, I firmly believe a strong regulatory body is needed to protect captive postal customers from unfairly shouldering the costs that might be incurred as a result of the competitive environment. I look forward to the Chairman's testimony and most importantly, his continuing participation in this critical dialogue as our subcommittee moves forward in the legislative process. Admittedly, many of the reforms contained in this bill are outside the scope of the present postal paradigm. However, the glass needed to be broken in examining the problems and proposing solutions for our nation's complex postal system. I believe this Reform Act of 1996 reflects a comprehensive and what I see is a balanced approach, and I want to emphasize the word balance, approach towards addressing the needs and concerns of the Postal Service, its employees, customers, and competitors. H.R. 3717 recognizes the dual objectives of preserving universal service at reasonable rates for all postal customers while responding to the competitive marketplace in which the Postal Service currently operates. This legislation and the ensuing process are of paramount importance. Reform best takes place outside a crisis atmosphere. Two years ago, the Postal Service found itself deep in red ink and reeling from a performance debacle which led to cries for privatization. Today, the Postal Service is projecting a year-end net, inco net income of almost $1 billion on top of last year's record $1.8 billion profit. The status quo may benefit some, However, it is our responsibility in this Congress to learn from the past and to take those steps necessary to protect postal customers from an increasing spiral of rate increases accompanied by diminishing services. H.R. 3717 represents an opportunity for Congress to seize the moment and enact comprehensive postal reform before we witness a return to those days of failed policy. Let me leave the script for a moment and also add words of tremendous gratitude to the staff of the subcommittee who have given so much of their time and their talents uh, to help produce this product. It is really a labor of, of their sometimes love, of their undying dedication. And although it's unlikely that their pictures may be hung on this wall any time in the near future, uh, I think it should be. They've done a tremendous job. I also want to not just welcome, but thank uh, the ranking minority member, Ms. Barbara Rose Collins, the gentlelady from Michigan, for her support of the efforts of this subcommittee, for hers and her staff's uh, efforts on our behalf as well. And with that, I'd like to turn the dais and the microphone over to the gentlelady for any comments she may wish to make at this time. I thank the chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to join you for the first in a series of four hearings to examine H.R. 3717, the Postal Reform Act of 1996. I would like to commend the chairman for bringing this issue to the table in an effort to answer the many calls for a more effective and efficient mail service that will lead this nation into the 21st century. During the first session of the 104th Congress, this subcommittee conducted 10 hearings providing general oversight and review of the operations of the Postal Service. The common theme echoed throughout those hearings was postal reform. Monopoly, labor management relations, rate making, and new postal products were all areas of major concern and possible areas to target for legislative change. As we concluded those hearings, we found there to be no consensus on the manner in which to achieve an overhaul of the current system. On June 25, 1996, Chairman McHugh introduced legislation based on testimony conveyed before this committee. Initial reaction to H.R. 3717 has been mixed. Comments have been minimal and concerns expressed have been limited, giving concerned parties a chance to thoroughly weigh the impact of this legislation. H.R. 3717 includes a few measures that are non-controversial and necessary. Title I encompasses many of these features. One non-controversial change is an increase in the salary for the Board of Governors. This is a welcomed provision and much needed increase 
for those who worked hard for what many considered a mere stipend. Further review of this legislation unveiled several areas of serious and potentially detrimental impact. Many provisions of H.R. 3717 pose a threat to the Postal Service's current ability to maintain universal service. Floodgates will be unleashed by these, this legislation that Congress sought to safeguard in the 1970 Postal Reorganization Act. Title IV of the proposed legislation grants the Postal Service sole discretion over deposits of revenue. It removes these publicly generated funds from the safeguard of the Department of Treasury and opens the door for revenues to be deposited in private institutions. This may be a blessing for the Postal Service, but it may very well be a nightmare for the federal government, the banking industry, and consumers if financial loss occurs. Another area of concern is the proposal found in Section 704, the Mailbox Demonstration Project. Current law prohibits the deposit of non-postage items in private mailboxes. H.R. 3717 would open the door for anyone to put non-postage items in any box. Regardless of the proposed three-year trial period and participation waiver, this provision would unleash more unwanted junk mail and create a serious breach in current mail security. Last and certainly not least are the provisions for the rate setting process. Current statutes governing this process have been labeled by many as cumbersome. The current process does not allow the Postal Rate Commission access to needed accounting systems or allow the performance of its own audits. H.R. 3717 would give the Postal Rate Commission greater power to request pertinent documents. However, the proposed legislation opens a whole new can of worms by instituting only two rate categories non-competitive and competitive. Non-competitive services would be subject to price cap regulations, while the USPS would have broad discretion to price competitive services. In an attempt to afford the Postal Service more independence, is it really necessary to give them carte blanche to consumers' pockets? Such changes need to be thoroughly examined as we consider implementing such an important provision. It has been my experience in this Congress, that is the 104th Congress, that when we speak of privatizing, it usually means the removal of African American jobs, and quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of this buzzword. Through this hearing and the three to follow, it is my hope that we carefully consider the Postal Reform Act of 1996 and its impact. To that end, I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to join the ranking minority member of the Government Reform Committee, Congresswoman Curtis Collins, in requesting that this subcommittee invite the Postal Board of Governors to testify on this very important reform measure. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentlelady. She, I guess we're going to have to hold a couple of hearings to kind of iron out those, those issues that you brought up, but uh, obviously they are serious concerns, and I appreciate her, her interest and uh, her willingness to examine them, and that's why we are here. Uh, let me make two comments before we proceed to the witnesses. The first is uh, I read in, in a publication that it is the subcommittee's intent to mark up this bill by the end of July. I want to disabuse anyone of that notion who may have it. We are on no such schedule, and, and indeed, as I have said to many of the people in this room privately, and I, want, I now want to say for the record, we're going to take as long as is necessary to do this uh, in a responsible way. Our concern is doing it correctly, not doing it quickly. And the issues that uh, Ms. Collins raises and that others will raise need to be addressed in a very serious in a very considered manner, and it is my intention to proceed in that fashion. Uh, to the second uh, point, the last comment by the gentlelady, as to the Postal Board of Governors, if, if the board wishes 
uh, in whatever way is appropriate under their rules who their chairman or whomever to, to uh, make an appearance and they indicate that to us uh, uh, under their procedures, we will certainly make that available. I, I have greatest respect for the governors. Uh, and if, if it's their body, uh, their considered b opinion as a body that they want to formally appear, we can work that out, and we will. Uh, with that, uh, as I have noted to uh, our witnesses before on previous occasions, I don't for a second trust, uh, uh, question their veracity, but the uh, committee rules, full committee rules, do require the swearing in of all witnesses that appear before the subcommittee. So if you'd raise, raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to present is the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that all three people at the table uh, responded in the affirmative. And with that, uh, Postmaster General Runyon, welcome. And the uh, floor, the microphone, and I, I would bet the attention of most people in this room is all on you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, join me here today are, are Mike Coughlin, our Deputy Postmaster General, and Mary O'Connell, our Senior Vice President and General Counsel. Nine days ago, we celebrated our 25th birthday. As you know, July the 1st, 1971, was the day that the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 took effect. The groundbreaking legislation crafted by Congress and the administration created the Postal Service and set a new course for mail service in the nation. Mr. Chairman, 18 months ago, you accepted a tough challenge to take the next legislative step to update the Postal Reorganization Act to help prepare the Postal Service to meet today's new and in many ways dramatically different communication needs. You put a lot of work into accomplishing this. You've held 12 subcommittee hearings. You've met and talked with hundreds of people, the governors, postal management, directors general of foreign posts, labor leaders, industry experts, and a wide variety of customers, people who know the mail and people who want it to succeed. We asked you for legislative reform and you responded. You've delivered a comprehensive bill, a good beginning to the process that can lead to great change, change that's good for all, change that can prepare the Postal Service and its customers for the next century. I think it's important to revisit the benchmarks you set for yourself and this legislation. You said you wanted a bill to maintain universal service at a uniform, affordable rate. You said you wanted to address the increasingly competitive communications marketplace by delivering long-needed pricing and product freedoms in creative new ways, while at the same time, strengthening oversight and reporting systems to safeguard the public interest. Mr. Chairman, your bill takes steps to address each of these areas. With any legislation of such size and magnitude, there are going to be areas of common ground and areas of concern. Mr. Chairman, there are some serious issues we want to work with you to address. I believe that you're on your way to delivering a bill that can successfully serve the mailing needs of the American people in the decades to come. First, let's look at the common ground. The bill completely changes our postal paradigm. It allows us to make profits from competitive services and offer rewards for financial success. It gives us some freedom in banking, borrowing, and investing. It introduces pricing latitude, market testing authority, volume discounts, and a test period for negotiated service agreements in the competitive product arena. For those products deemed non-competitive, it introduces the rate index concept. It deregulates our use of international air transportation. It provides for direct appeals of MSPB decisions. And it levies, levies stiff penalties against people who commit violent acts against postal contractors, stalk postal employees are pander by mail. However, we do have some areas of concern. Three major issues that we'd like to address with you as the bill moves forward in Congress. First among our concerns is regulation and oversight. Mr. Chairman, checks and balances are appropriate and necessary in both government and business. And being a bit of both, we recognize that we'll be held to the high standard. 
However, we're concerned that some of the systems, precautions, and shifts in authority put forward here with good intent unnecessarily add regulation, duplicate safeguards, and substitute bureaucratic controls for marketplace discipline. For example, the re-regulation of half of our highly competitive international business, which is now fully deregulated, would be a step backward for this growing product line. Then there's the issue of oversight. Today, the Postal Rate Commission, the General Accounting Office, the Inspector General, two houses of Congress, and an independent auditor all have some oversight and audit authority. The proposed bill would add two new layers of oversight authority, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, and give a significantly greater role to the PRC. Expanded Postal Rate Commission authority would overlap that of the Postal Services Board of Governors in the area of service, productivity, finances, and overall performance. Mr. Chairman, we need to give additional thought to what could become conflicting mandates or agendas which may not serve our customers' best interest. And overlapping PRC complaint and antitrust provisions could inhibit new products and innovations. <laughs> We'd like to work with you to bring better balance to this area in terms of liability, accountability, and control. Second is rate setting. We appreciate the efforts of the subcommittee to streamline and simplify the rate making process, providing flexibility to adjust rates annually if needed, so long as they re remain below an appropriate measure of inflation is a thoughtful, progressive approach to the pricing of public services. We feel there are opportunities to simplify still further in this area, to set pricing guidelines that are clear from the start that everyone can see, anticipate, and budget for. We look forward to discussing them with you. Finally, there's the bottom line, the price of business flexibility. The bill would create some new revenue opportunities and cost savings. There is a new pricing latitude granted by the bill to six competitive products. We anticipate gains from volume discounts and the test of service agreements. Adding in savings from the deregulation of international transportation and new investment freedoms, we expect to make about $370 million a year. Then there are the costs. The bill would wipe out the $1 billion debt the government owes America's postage ratepayers. While it would continue to provide for free mail service for the blind, it would end congressional appropriations to pay for that service, about $60 million a year. It would end workers' compensation payments to the Department of Labor for employees who retired under the old post office department, another $240 million hit. The relaxation of the private express statutes by the establishment of a $2 piece threshold would put more than $4 billion of our current business at risk. Bottom line, the bill is likely to cost some $2 billion in the first year alone. <coughs> And these costs would begin immediately. A lot of the opportunities for new revenue would be delayed for 18 months until the completion of the baseline omnibus rate case. This imbalance between revenues and costs is a deep concern to us. Mr. Chairman, I know you recognize the highly competitive marketplace in which we find ourselves. We have intense competition in every area of our business. I have the greatest confidence in the employees of the Postal Service and their ability to run on an even track with our private sector opponents and win the race. Effective competitive response is the key. It's at the heart of maintaining affordable universal service, service for everyone, everywhere, every day. The number one benchmark we both feel that this legislation must meet. The bill would extend limited pricing flexibility to only six postal products, 12 percent of our business. We're committed to working with you to address this issue and make the price of business flexibility a price we and all postal customers are prepared to pay. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, you've taken on a massive and what many would call a thankless task. So let me fix the last part. 
and thank you for your initiative, your courage, and your determination to make change happen in a fair, balanced, and thoughtful way. The bill you've crafted is a solid beginning. We have a lot of common ground to build on. We recognize that legislative reforms a long process, and we're going to be in it with you for the long haul. We look forward to working with you to implement a bill that can serve the mailing needs of the American people in the 21st century. Thank you very much. And now, Mike and Mary and I would be glad to answer questions that you have. Thank you, uh, General Runyon. I appreciate, as always, your comments and your time. Um, let me, let me start with some of the comments that you made during the course of your, your testimony uh, <coughs> to try to get a fuller picture of, of where uh, and how you view certain components of this bill. Uh, first of all, just a point of information, we had 14 hearings, but who's counting? Uh, <laughs> but uh, you mentioned that uh, we're only moving six of your products into the competitive area. Uh, I get the, the impression from that that you feel we should have gone further in that regard. And uh, you don't, in your testimony, uh, expand or expound upon that. Uh, are there other product areas that are remaining in the non-competitive uh, category or basket that you feel we ought to move over into the competitive area? And if so, which ones might they be? Yes, sir. Uh, in analyzing the bill, we have come up with, with some. We, we would like to continue to look at those because we haven't had a lot of time to really get down into the, the bottom line on this thing. But, uh, you, for example, every product we have has some competition. Even first-class mail that we consider in the monopoly has some competition. I'm not asking to move that out. I'm just saying that we have competition there. We've lost over $2 billion worth of business in that segment alone in the F&T uh, part of our business in the last five years. So we have competition there through fax and email and, and uh, the, uh, the net. So there's competition there. One area that... Uh, may, may I interrupt you there? Sure. Because I think terminology is important here. Is that competition or is that alternatives? And I understand that's a free, that's a, it's a fine line. But I don't see how we, in this or any other bill of, of practical implications, end those kinds of, or anyway, level the playing field of those kinds of alternatives. I mean, when we see competition, I, I'm really trying to focus on those areas where you're really going head to head with some entity. And I in agree. first class, there is no such thing. Yeah, I agree with, I okay. agree with that totally. Uh, we see our business going away. Okay. And so I'm saying that as we see that business going away by other people, you call them alternatives, and they are. And by the way, we're doing a pretty good uh, against some of those alternatives. We had some alternative uh, delivery systems that have closed their doors because they can't compete with us anymore in, in those arenas. So th we, we've been doing fairly good there. But an area that, that we could talk about is advertising mail. Now, there are... Again, we're talking alternatives. There is nobody else that can take a, a piece of advertising material and put it in our mailbox. I think that's what the mailbox test is all about. But there is nobody else that can put a stamp on it and put it in our, in our mailbox. But we do have alternatives out there. And uh, you take television, radio, newspapers. Those are people that are taking our business. And in, in the area of advertising mail, uh, it might be that we should better control our pricing on that and how we deal with that. I, I just put that out as, as an example. As I say, we're studying this bill still to try to come up with the, the things that we, we think might fit in different kinds of boxes. So that's, that's really where we are with that. Okay, well, d let's just say then that this is an important point for the development of this bill. There will be others, I feel cer fairly certain, that will come forward and say we have gone beyond the bounds of reason by moving those products that we have into a, a, a more unregulated, to use a conflicting terms, a more unregulated environment, a deregulated environment. Uh, and we certainly want to entertain those areas that you feel uh, we could go further into in providing you the kind of ability to compete uh, that you think is not just necessary, uh, but indeed appropriate. 
You say that the six products uh, in question represent about 12 percent of your business. Yes, sir. Uh, I note, uh, and not everybody had as much fun over the Fourth of July weekend as I did in reading all of these testimonies we'll hear today, but in, uh, in Chairman Gleiman's comments, he, he ranks it at 14 percent. I suppose that's an insignificant amount, although it's a large amount of money. But how much money are we talking about in your estimation? What is 12 percent uh, of, of your business now being deregulated? How many millions, I, I suspect billions of dollars might that be? Mike says six to seven million. Billion. Six billion. billion, six I mean. Seven billion. Yeah. Would be. Okay. So it's a significant, uh, significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I think it's important to note, and again, and, and I'm not here to nitpick, but I think if we're going to address this bill, we've got to be cautious about what we say. This bill, unlike your current regime where you're, you're held to a break-even standard, uh, allows you to make a profit not only in the competitive area, but if you're good enough in the non or clever enough or whatever in the non-competitive area as well. I mean, you can derive profit, so that's a little bit different as well. I'm not sure you're calculating that. Uh, in your overall mathematical assessment of this of this uh, legislation, but as you go forward, I'd, I'd <coughs> urge you to consider that at least because I think uh, the the standard we're set re creating here anew of of not requiring a break even is a significant one. Would well, you agree or disagree? Well, Mr. Chairman, I I think that I, I know that there is an ability to make a profit there. And that means that I've got to really change my paradigm because I'm not, frankly, of the opinion that the Postal Service really should be making a profit. I think the Postal Service should be breaking even, providing universal service at an affordable rate. And if we could drop those rates, it would be even better. Mm -hmm. So I think when we find ourselves in a position of making profit, that we should be then dropping our rates so that we do break even. Uh, we shouldn't be a money-making proposition. Now, I realize that I've talked a lot about the fact we made $1.8 billion last year and we're going to make $1 billion this year. But even after we make $1 billion this year, we will still have a negative equity of over $3.5 billion. And so we have got to somehow get rid of that negative equity, and the only way you do that is to make a profit. But I think after we make that profit and get the negative equity to zero, then our objective as a postal service would be to deliver our mail and not make a profit. And, and I realize what you're saying that we have the opportunity to make that profit. And in, in the competitive area, market demand should determine what we set our prices at. And if the market will allow us to charge more for some of those services because that's what the market allows, then we ought to do that. If we can make a profit on that, then that would help us to maintain our rates at a lower rate on the things that apply to the universal service. Okay. Uh, you, you make some important points for the record and points that I'm sure Mr. Gleiman is taking down with great interest as well. Uh, I would like, to, if I could interrupt here, because we've been joined by two members, uh, both of particular note, but I, I want to uh, uh, signify with great uh, gratitude uh, the presence of full Committee Chairman, Mr. William Klinger, gentleman from Pennsylvania. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I really very definitely wanted to attend this hearing because it is of enormous importance. And I think it is the kickoff. I hope it's going to be a very successful legislative endeavor, thanks to the fine work that uh, you and your subcommittee have been doing in, in uh, really touching every facet of, of this uh, very important activity, federal activity. And, and I think the bill that you produced is uh, an outstanding uh, effort, and I want to commend you on that, and uh, wanted to be here to hear some of the testimony from some of the witnesses. Thank, thank the gentleman very much, and whatever we've achieved is because the chairman has been enormously uh, understanding and patient, and I appreciate that. Also, uh, from the minority side, a gentleman who has attended, uh, I believe, all of our hearings, and for that I'm very, very grateful, a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, Dean Green. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll submit a statement for the record, but I want to congratulate you on, on putting together a bill. Uh, it's been talked about for uh, 25 years, and, uh, and you have it, and I look forward to the hearings over the next month so we can look at your bill, and, and, uh, and on first glance, it's a good start, and, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to working on it. 
Thank you. And thank the gentleman, as I said, for not just his support, but his participation. Without objection, his uh, opening comments will be placed in the record in their entirety. Uh, uh, General Runyon, let, let's go back to your testimony for a moment. You mentioned uh, that the, the bill uh, and what you assess as its various impacts could, could cost the Postal Service, uh, I forget the exact figure you ascribed, several billion dollars. Two billion. Two billion at risk. Uh, you mentioned when you talked about the relaxation of the private express statutes, meeting the, uh, moving the threshold from $6 to $2, could put $4 billion at risk. Uh, let me make a, a comment and, let, and, and you respond to it. Uh, at risk, it seems to me, means competition. I've got to be frank with you. I thought that was the, the purpose of this exercise, to put you in a position to compete. And uh, we have tried to do it in a variety of ways, taking what we think is a balanced approach, but it is certainly a multi-directional approach. I think all would agree to that. Uh, what part of that four billion did you calculate into the cost of the two billion? One and a half. How did you arrive at that? Because if you're out there competing, at risk doesn't necessarily mean that you'll lose a cent of it. Well, wh what you say is true, but we just use the uh, models that we had and the pricing that we had. Uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done I understand. before we come to a conclusion here, but that's, that's what our models would indicate today under present existing conditions uh, that that would, would cost us. Well, it, it, as you go forward, uh, and others use that phrase, at risk, and, and I understand this, but at risk means the ability or the opportunity or perhaps right. the requirement to compete. And I don't know what your models look like, but they don't have the faith in the Postal Service that I do. So I'm not so sure you'd lose a cent off it, but uh, we, can, we can revisit that. Uh, I don't, I don't want to uh, hog the, uh, the microphone here. I've got a lot more questions, and we can go around several times, but I, I certainly want to defer uh, to the other members that are kind enough to be here. They have busy schedules as well, and I would say ask the chairman if he has any questions he'd like to direct to the <coughs> panel. The gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, I apologize for not being here earlier, but our schedules are so crazy always. But, uh, but I have a number of questions after looking at the testimony over the last few days, and Postmaster General, and and, uh, and after hearing some of your responses to the question today, first of all, the one that I came we came up with yesterday is a marketability design, and and where would the profits go? You may have talked about that in saying the profits would go to pay down the debt that, that you owe. And how would it be reinvested if there is a if there is a profit to be made after the uh, uh, after the debt is paid down? Where would that be reinvested in the institution, just like you would, like another business would, and new equipment um, or what have you? And uh, and also the uh, the administration of the bonuses that would be allowed in here. And how would you determine fair and equitable is is suggested in Title Ten of the bill? Well, first on the, the reinvestment, we, we have a five-year plan right now to spend $9 billion in, in new capital. And actually, I think that number is, is probably low uh, because I think we need to go into more uh, automation and then, then that $9 billion will allow us. Any good business would want to raise that money so we wouldn't have to go borrow that money. In the past, we've borrowed money for capital investments. We've been able to reduce the amount of borrowings that we have recently, and we'd like to continue to reduce that. So we would take the monies if we had a surplus of funds to reinvest. I wouldn't necessarily consider that a profit, but I consider that something that we would use to keep the business going to make it more efficient so that we could eventually reduce prices. And I also I indicated that one of the things I'd like to do would be to reduce prices uh, because I think the American public is due what we can recover by being efficient. So I think that's, that's the way that we would do that. Okay. The, uh, and, and under question, you talked about the postal paradigm, and, and could you just tell us a little bit of what that means? And, and I guess if in your analysis of the bill, would that be an increase 
in the first class rates, for example, from 32 to 52 cents. And let me throw those of you like puns in my district, they would say that looks like a couple of paradigms to me. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but if you could just tell us about the postal paradigm. Well, the bill, as we see it, we, we keep rereading this bill, and, and every time we read it, we see something different in it. And, and one of the problems that I'm having in dealing with the bill is I've only been in the Postal Service four years, and, and I learned the way it was. This bill will sort of change the way the Postal Service will operate more than just a little bit. People like uh, Mike, who has been here a much longer period of time, is probably more set in his ways on how the Postal Service is operated. And I think what this bill does is interject a lot of new ideas, which is good. I mean, we're, we're looking for that. We're just like everybody else. When you go to make change, you kind of back off and look at it and say, you know, is this really good for me? And, and that's what I'm talking about in, in the paradigm. I think it's a major paradigm. Mike, would you want to address I, that? If I could just add, because he hit right on, on something I've been dealing with since we uh, saw the bill a couple of weeks ago. It, it, when I first saw the bill, I, I had a hard time looking at it and, and escaping from my experience over the last 25 years, the current rate-making scheme uh, with revenue requirements and the 10-month the litigation with the Postal Rate Commission and some of the, the, the kind of litigious activity that goes on around that. But the more I thought about it, the more I began to appreciate that this really does make you think about this process in an entirely different way. It, it brings a whole new set of forces to play. I'm not sure they're all good, and I'm not saying that all the pieces of this particular solution are the right ones, but it, it really does represent a different way of looking at the marketplace, at the way we change rates, at uh, potentially at the way we control costs. I, I got a letter just this week from a person that says, when are you going to get in the real world? When are you going to act like a business? Any other business like you're in would be cutting their prices 10%, and increasing their volume. This bill would allow us to do that. Because the bill says we can't go up, but so much. It doesn't say we can't go down. Right now, it takes uh, uh, quite a long period of time for us to go down on rates, and we have to have, to have a rate case to do it. Under this bill, we could just drop the first class rate by five cents and uh, you know, try to increase our volume. I don't know that that would do it, and I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying that. It's a whole new paradigm. We can do things under this bill we couldn't do before. Now, there are certain things that, that we don't like too well, and that, that is not one of them. Mr. Chairman, I, we don't have lights, and I know if I run out of my time, but, uh, but I have a number of questions that uh, just kind of wave at me and tell me if I've, I'm using up too much of the time. Another question about the, the trial program with opening up the mailboxes and the safety and privacy issue, and I know um, and I know comparing to other industrialized nations that uh, Germany and Sweden, for example, although I also know that even though they're industrialized nations, we are a little bit different from our neighbors in Europe or, or Western Europe or even Northern Europe on the use of the post office for utility bills, for example, or things like that, that they may, that may not be the case in, in Sweden or Germany, although we try to compare apples to apples. And can you talk about a little bit of the, the opening up of the, the post office boxes or, or the ones that are at our homes necessarily to, uh, to other delivery systems? The, the one concern, well, probably there's more than one concern, but one concern that I have is the sanctity of the mailbox uh, I think would be lost when you open it up to anybody to be using the mailbox. One of the concerns we have today uh, is that Anybody can go to a mailbox and take something out. But right now, it's against the law to do that. It's against the law to even open the mailbox door unless you are a letter carrier or a postal employee. Under the test, anybody could put mail in that box. And, and you don't know whether it's going in or coming out. That's a real problem. And I think that's from, from a from a standpoint of sanctity, I think that's a concern. Uh, I think, uh, again, Mike has been here a lot longer than I have, and he could talk about more about the operational concept of that. Uh, there are some operational issues to be dealt with in the test, but this, this particular 
piece of the bill along with the section that would relax the private express statutes are the two parts of the bill that I think fundamentally get at uh, uh, and potentially endanger our ability to, to provide a, an affordable universal service, which I think is an underlying uh, theme here and what this whole thing is all about. Uh, Mr. Runyon mentioned the uh, operating problems with them. Um, there are problems. It's, it's a practice in this country for you or I to be able to leave mail, outgoing mail, in a box. Uh, that box and nothing else is going to be in there when the carrier comes by, picks it up, and takes it away. It's a, it's a post office at your, at your front door almost. That becomes, obviously, is one issue. It becomes more complicated when you've got other material in the box as well. Um, well, gentlemen, you? Yes. I don't disagree with anything either uh, that the Postmaster General or, or uh, Mr. Coughlin said. I think these are concerns, but I would note they are at this moment, although very serious, nothing more than concerns. Mm -hmm. And uh, to my knowledge, there has never been a test of this issue officially sanctioned. Maybe in some communities they do it and we all don't know about it, but officially sanctioned. And uh, it was very strongly suggested on the record when we had the heads of postal services from other nations before the subcommittee that where it is done in other countries, it is not a problem. Now, I, I agree with the gentleman. That doesn't mean it's necessarily transferable at all to this country. We have different realities and different expectations. But the, the test is designed to try to get a better framing of that, of that issue here. And uh, we were very careful in letting the, the post office, postal service, be the authors of the, of the study so that if there was uh, a, a commission of error, it would be more than likely on the side of caution. Because I don't want to do anything that unnecessarily or, or directly challenges the ability of, of that universal service at uniform price. Uh, that, that doesn't mean I'm right, you're wrong, or we're right. all right or wrong. It's just that is the reasoning. And if at the end it shows the kinds of concerns are indeed reality, then, then we consider that. But it, that is the intent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to Certainly. prolong this, but uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right. The bill does allow us to, to kind of structure the test uh, across the three cities, and then the GAO eventually uh, uh, checks it out, I guess, or audits it. But one of the things I've puzzled about is how do we structure a test where we can really know whether there's success or failure? Uh, that part I, I haven't been able to fathom yet, uh, and I'm not, it's not clear to me how almost any test will really get at the potential, the potential long-term threat to uh, our ability to provide universal service with a short-term test like that. It's, it's a puzzler, and I think we need to spend some time perhaps talking with your it people. Is the problem in the words you use short-term, or is the problem in the very nature of the issue? I think sometimes it, it may well be in short term. I think uh, if, for example, if the mailbox rule were be, to be eliminated tomorrow, I don't think we'd see a, a, a tremendous outrush uh, of, of material from the U.S. mail to an alternative carrier, uh, which is which is one potential longer term threat. I think uh, it's again, it's just not clear to me how we're going to measure success in that test. And uh, I'm not saying there isn't an answer to that, but it's not been made itself clear yet. Well, uh, I think there, there are two sides to that equation. Uh, one is, you're right, if we're calling for a test, then we have to design one that somehow and in reasonable ways pro uh, projects and, and ultimately defines the outcome. But with all due respect, I would suggest if you are the ones who are concerned that opening up the mailbox is going to lead to some minor or major catastrophe, it's up to you to define what that catastrophe is as well. I don't know. You're the ones that are saying it. I assume you have concerns of outcome. So what are the catastrophe? It's up to you to define what that catastrophe is as well. I don't know. You're the ones that are saying it. I assume you have concerns of outcome. So what are they? And you measure for them. But you're right, we shouldn't prolong this. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. He's been very patient. I yield back. Let me uh, go back to the, the question of the bonuses that the bill talks about. And, and now I, the Postal Service does not provide bonuses. If the postmaster in Houston, for example, has a 99% uh, 
success rate or uh, delivery rate as compared to someone with a 79%. There's no way to reward that postmaster. Is that correct under current law? Under the current law, we can pay anyone up to the pay cap. And we, we do have a bonus program right now. Uh, the bonus program, uh, if things, if we continue down the road we're going right now, uh, that postmaster might be entitled to as much as a 28 percent bonus this year. Okay. Now that wouldn't all be paid out this year. The bonus we've got paid out is the economic value added and we'd pay out part of that this year because we want to make sure that they continue to do good. And if they were to have a bad year, part of that bonus, which is banked, we say, uh, they would lose. So there's, there's a way to lose it and there's a way to get it. And that's only available to supervisors, I imagine? It's that's not available to uh, our, our management, except for people like uh, Mr. Coughlin, who uh, is $400 charged the cap. Uh, we had a bonus last year, and uh, some of our uh, people got as high as $16,000. Uh, Mr. Coughlin got $400. So we were able to do that now. As I read the bill, uh, the bill would allow uh, Mr. Coughlin to also participate in the bonus program. We probably have somewhere around, and, and this I haven't checked, it depends on the size of the bonus, but about 200 people right now that uh, regardless of the bonus, they would not get all of it. Some of them get some of it, but they can't get it all under the present uh, way it's being administered. Probably equally important is that the current system goes down through all of our non-exempt, or excuse me, our exempt employees uh, now. It, it, they all have an opportunity to share in the, the organization's success or failure. But it doesn't cover, for example, I'm, I, I, Let me add one other thing, units. too. It does not cover bargaining unit employees yet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a lot of other questions, but I'll be glad to defer to some of the colleagues who are here. Well, I, I, I could go further as far as bargaining unit employees are concerned. I would like to see bonuses applied to all employees of the Postal Service. I would like to see pay for performance be the way people are paid, as opposed to getting a pay increase every year because another year came by. I'd like to see performance be the criteria for pay. Then you love my bill, because that's what it does. Right. I like that part of that bill great. Well, I should know when to let well enough alone, but I want to... Mr. Chairman, <laughs> we might, this side might have a little trouble with that, although uh, I'm glad they don't pay Congress on that, particularly this session. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the, other, the other important point about this is beyond your current bonus system, this one, as was just noted, applies to all employees, and certainly that was one of our major intents, to, to get that kind of reward system down to... Uh, what are known as the rank and file, but as I know you agree, Mr. Runyon, are really the heart and soul of the Postal Service. But also it provides going away again from the break-even provisions to a profit uh, motive that would, I hope, and I feel relatively certain, would encourage those rank and file employees to become more effective, more efficient, because the incentive is now there for them to help generate a profit, which in turn could be directed in part back to them. That's you know, private sector thinking, I, I believe. I've been around here for long enough to lose some of that. But. I hate to say this, but I had missed the part that this is for every employee in the Postal Service in the bill. I just, I just didn't, didn't read it right. I just, my blood pressure went up 97 <laughs> points until I saw everyone nodding yes, I guess. Right. So. Oh, I understand. Uh, See, I missed it. Well, we probably still have other issues, but uh, let, let's move on. I, I'd like to... Uh, I uh, acknowledge uh, gratefully the presence of the gentleman from New York, a little bit downstate for me, Major Owens, and uh, turn the microphone over to him for either opening statement or questions, or if he has any at this time. I was chairman. I was detained and missed most of the testimony. I would like to yield to my colleague, Mr. Green, if he had another few questions that he didn't cover. And I'll submit some questions in writing. Going back on the, uh, the question, the bill would limit you on increases, for example, in first class from, in the example was 32 cents to 52 cents. Um, how is that would compare to right now? I know the Postal Rate Commission may take a year or longer on first class rates, but what would the bill do as compared to what it uh, 
the current law now on first class postage well as i understand the bill there would be a a factor set that we could go to now i think g d p p i is is the base factor and then there is an x factor which uh... troubles us considerably uh... the x factor uh... seems to be rather subjective which was my next question could you talk about the x factor so maybe some of us who who didn't do very well in high school algebra could understand the x factor well it's uh... it's a factor that to me is is rather subjective as i as i read the bill i may not quite understand it thoroughly but i i have no problem at all with having an index it says i have been talking about cpi and to say you know if you would say that we can't raise our prices any more than cpi goes up because that's what i've been referring i've not referred to gdppi before because that's not something that that people normally talk about they normally talk about cpi uh, although i know the gdppi is used in in other areas for rate setting purposes uh, if you use that then I wouldn't have a problem because that means that you have to be productive. And I'm firmly of the opinion that we should be productive enough so that we could keep within the, the rate index. Now, I would point out that we had a price increase um, after four years, and, and that price index was two points below CPI. I don't know how it related to GDP. I haven't. We, didn't, we weren't looking at that. We were looking at CPI. But we were below CPI. Now, if CPI were to be the index that was in, in effect, then we would have been able to just change that rate ourselves without going to a postal rate commission because it would be below what we were considering an index. If, if we considered GDPPI, I had to go back and see if we could have actually raised our prices to 10.3% on average that we did raise. So the indexing idea I like that idea uh, I'm very concerned though about the subjective nature of the X factor and I need to learn a lot more about that and I think all of us do on that. my last question is and I know this creates an inspector general uh, that all we're fairly familiar with in, in other agencies and yet um, in how do you view the creation or the, the inspector general being involved, for example, in the collective bargaining that, that this bill does not touch? Well, we, we have an inspector general now. Uh, this creates, the change is that the inspector general would be appointed by the president. Uh, at the present time, our inspector general, uh, who also is our chief inspector, does do collective bargaining with the Postal Police Union. They, they're involved in that because the Postal Police work for the Chief Inspector. Under this bill, uh, I would assume, if I read it correctly, the Inspector General would really not be controlling the Chief Inspector, so the Chief Inspector would do any negotiating. Uh, the Inspector General would not be involved, I don't believe, in any kind of collective bargaining. So that's the only change. That's the only change you can see in, in, in how. Well, there's there is another change that um, is is very objectionable to our board of governors and uh, also to ourselves. And that is it's presidentially appointed. Uh, we think that the system is working. We have a uh, inspector general right now, uh, and we think the inspector general is doing a good job of carrying out their duties and responsibilities of waste, fraud, and abuse, which is what they're they're set out to do. And uh, we, we think it's working. And uh, I guess we don't understand why it needs to be presidentially appointed. If I could add to that, there's a, um, another provision in instituting an inspector general for the rate commission, the postal rate commission. And it's not clear, we're still trying to understand the intent, it's not clear what role that uh, inspector general at the rate commission would have vis-a-vis -vis rate cases or in activities that may translate back to the Postal Service. And, you know, we're assuming it would, and that one is, that one is appointed by the, not a presidentially appointed by the head of the agency. And I think that um, we would spend some time with the staff and try to figure out what the clarity would be between the role of the two inspectors general. Yeah, normally inspectors general um, 
would have the authority to go into any kind of a relationship. For example, our inspector general can go into uh, um, our, our um, vendors and check on how they figure their prices and things of that nature. Uh, we would have to assume that the inspector general of the Postal uh, Rate Commission could also come in and check on how we do our rates, in addition to our inspector general being able to do that also. So we, we kind of see double jeopardy there. It may, it may not be that way, but that's the way we see it under the inspector general law, that they have the authority to go do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe I can help. First of all, I want to make it very clear, and, and the purpose of these hearings is really not for me to stay, sit here and, and to defend the bill, not that I in any way object to that, uh, but I really am far more interested in, in trying mm -hmm. to ascertain for the record your concerns, but nevertheless, uh, as a point of, two points of information, I, I want it to be very clear that I in no way, nor does anything in this bill intend to criticize the current Inspector General. I've, I've met with him. I, I admire the man. Uh, his, his record as an as a employee of the Postal Service and his, his record in, in the current position are exemplary. I, however, am concerned about, if nothing more, the, the sense and the impression that is given when a 55-plus billion dollar enterprise that we are now moving or attempting to move very deliberately toward, for the lack of a better word at the moment, commercialization, has an IG who is internalized to the extent that this IG is ex internalized. And, and in, across this government, at this level of function, uh, I'm not aware of another agency that has that structure. I won't say it's inappropriate, but it is troubling. Beyond that, we have heard time and time again from particularly employees who have the impression, and I'm not saying it's correct, but, but like in politics, uh, sometimes impression is reality and perception is reality. We have the impression that the IG is directly controlled by the administration and the, yourself and the Board of Governors and therefore has little trust. They have li little if no trust in, in the IG, and that greatly, in my opinion, hinders the IG's ability to pursue certain matters. So that is the reasoning, and it's not in any way intended to be critical of the current process. It's to clean it up in terms of structure and to conform it with other IG functions. As to the IG and the PRC, we are proposing, as you know, Mr. Ronyan, that we assigned to the PRC rather extraordinary new powers, power of a subpoena. Uh, in that regard, we presume there will be proprietary information that may be exposed, and we feel it is important for the PRC to have an inspector general to perform those very new, and for them, working in this new paradigm, very different functions as well. And if we're looking for a way to understand their role in the process as uh, Ms. Alcano suggested, I would suggest perhaps we look at the functions of, of the IG in the FCC, because that is the model upon which we built it. So maybe by looking at those, we can mm -hmm. help to better understand the, the reasoning there. The uh, gentleman uh, has left. I'd be happy to yield to the chairman. Uh, folks, maybe Mr. Klinger. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Runyon. I appreciate your testimony and uh, your thoughts on this uh, really, I think, landmark piece of legislation that we're undertaking to start the consideration of here today. As I understand it from having a cursory uh, review of the legislation, it would take the Postal Service out of uh, the appropriations process uh, where you are now uh, receive somewhere around $100 million, as I understand it, through the appropriations process. Uh, what impact Will that, well, maybe you could explain a little bit how that appropriation process works now and how, what the impact of taking the Postal Service out from under that, uh, uh, that process would impact upon uh, your nonprofit uh, mailers in view of the fact that, that it really is uh, their, their benefit that exists. 
there are two ways that we're affected. First is the, is the first year effect. And um, we get money from, from Congress today to pay for workers' compensation cases of post office employees. By post office employees, I mean those members of the post office before it became the U.S. Postal Service. And, and the, at the time that legislation was organized in 1970, it was decided by Congress at that time that they would be responsible for any cost associated with those employees who were members of the old post office department. Uh, that amounts uh, to us um, over the first year roughly $240 million, first year. Mm -hmm we'd have to write off. And then uh, each year after that, it would cost us around $15 million that we would pay to those workers. Mm -hmm. um, under the not-for-profit mailers, in 1983, uh, Congress owed the Postal Service about $1.2 billion because they had not paid what, well, it, what they had owed at that time. And so they passed a bill and said, we're going to get out of this business of giving you money. And so the way we're going to do that is that uh, they passed a bill, and the bill said that we owe you $1.2 billion, and so therefore we're going to pay that off at the rate of $29 million a year, and we'll do that for 42 years, provided Congress reappropriates that every year. Um, and we received that money for a couple of years. Um, so if that were stopped, which the bill recommends, uh, it would cost us in our, our profit and loss statement $350 million first year. Then every year after that would cost us somewhere around $29 million. Um, the other thing where we're affected is um, free mail for the blind and for overseas voters. People who are overseas can, can vote free, and mail for the blind is provided free. That amounts to, on an ongoing basis, about $62 million a year. Um, and when you add that all up, it would, it would come up to roughly $100 million, $105 million a year that we would not receive in appropriation. <coughs> okay. First year would be roughly $600 million. But then thereafter, it would uh, be a hundred million, about a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, only other question I had related to the um, proposal to create a presidential postal employee management commission to help address what I think uh, everybody would agree have been some fairly serious uh, uh, labor management issues uh, in the past. To to help alleviate some of that and to undertake part of the mediation uh, uh, apparatus in this thing. How do you view this, or do you view that uh, as helpful? Uh, in looking at the, um, at, at the bill and knowing you know, not that much about it yet, uh, I don't know if that commission is going to lead to legislation that would legislate our labor relations matters. Right now, we're under the National Labor Relations Bill except that we do have some things that have been legislated by Congress. Uh, for example, we have mandatory binding arbitration. Uh, that has been legislated. Uh, I don't know if this would lead to more legislation or not. If it did lead to more legislation, then you know, I could be in favor of it or I could be opposed to it, depending on, on what that legislation was. Uh, the GAO has just made a study. Um, well, you're not saying, you're saying do you think it's superfluous, though? Do you think you, that the uh, existing structure would permit you to address the problems that uh, are hopefully would be addressed by this commission? Well, uh, GAO made a study recently, about a year and a half study, and they, they released that about a year ago. And when they released that study, uh, we went forward to our unions and said, look, we got this study, let's sit down and try to work out these things. Just so happened that that came about at the time we were in negotiations on our contracts. And they said, we don't want to talk to you right now because we're in negotiations. Well, we're out of negotiations, and it looks like that next month we're going to sit down and have a meeting with all of our union leaders and employee organizations uh, to discuss those things. Now, 
if, if we start the commission, um, what I don't know is whether it would slow that down if people say, well, there's no need for us to meet on this GAO report because we're going to have another report and we'll wait and see what that says. I don't know if it'd slow it down or not. It might uh, slow down the need or the, the willingness of people to participate in that if they thought that, well, why should we agree with something here now when in, in, another, might supplant in another two years or so? I think the first report is due after 18 months and then a year later is another report, if I remember it correctly. We are going to be in negotiations in uh, 1998, I believe, with all of our unions, again, on wages and, and other matters, and I don't know how the timing would be. I know that when the, uh, the Capital Commission met, I believe that the Capital Commission completed their work in one year, and uh, that work set up the Postal Reform Bill of 1970. Uh, so I would, would think that if we were going Shorten to... Shorten the time if we were going to go into a commission, it would be better to, to shorten it down mm -hmm. as short as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. I'd uh, happy to yield to the ranking uh, member. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Runyon, when you go to buy a new car, you tend to get overwhelmed by the car salesman. He or she tries to dazzle you with fancy descriptions and features, but the bottom line for me and the people in my district and consumers across this country is what is all of this going to cost me? I have a series of questions for you to respond to. Just what does this new postal paradigm mean? How much more will it cost to mail a first class letter? Will rates stay at 32 cents or balloon up to 52 cents? Is this going to make our mail service better? or create administrative chaos? And will you operate more like a business or abandon our commitment to maintain a universal postal service at a uniform, affordable rate? How about first, the cost? Well, first, I don't think that, that the bill, uh, depending on how it ends up, uh, would, would even start to do what you're talking about to a first class letter. Uh, the idea would Which, be- what, what am I talking about? raising the price from 32 cents to 52 cents. Will it raise the price at all? It shouldn't increase the price. At all? I don't think the bill itself will do that. That price is going to be determined by our cost mm -hmm. and, and our volume. If our volume drops, the cost goes up. Have you uh, figured that out yet, that our volume will drop or go up? or? Our volume... Um, right now is not going up the way we anticipated that it would go up this year. So that We're means the cost will go up? Well, unless we reduce our, our, our cost. Mr. Runyon, I ask you again. Will the cost of a letter go up? Do you project the cost of a letter going up? Over, over time, the cost of mail will probably increase. It has for the past 25 years. I don't anticipate any huge increases because of this bill. Uh, I just don't understand why it would. So uh, you mean like two cents or five cents, the usual? Well, I can speak only in the near future. Um, we don't expect that prices are going to go up in 1997. We see our way clear this year to have a no price increase in 1996. And uh, with the plans that we have in place now, we think that the, the price will not go up in 1997. Now, I did just get through saying we're, we're at a break-even, basically, in 1997. As a matter of fact, we look like we would make about $55 million based on our plans at the present time in 1997. Now, if this bill got passed in 1997, then that $55 million gain would have some loss to it. Uh, we would have to take a loss that year if we didn't do something to offset it. We should always be trying to offset any, any cost. Then and the price are. will go up. It wouldn't necessarily go how up in How can you offset costs? You either, I mean, how do you offset costs? Well, you offset costs through, through productivity. You offset costs what through... What does that mean? You mean lay off people? No, it, it means having looked at all of our processes, determining a better way to do it. Uh, it means the longer we hold our prices the same, the more our volume 
stays the same or goes up. When we raise prices, volume comes down. I know that. And if we lowered prices, volume might go up. We don't really know that. So you might lower prices then. We have the capability to under this law, but I'm not, I'm not holding my breath to think that that's the first thing we'd do. So you won't be lowering prices. <laughs> okay, um, Mr. Runyon, time and again, time again in appearances before this subcommittee and in ads taken out in major newspapers across the country, you've stressed the importance and the success of the U.S. Postal Service in improving the overnight delivery of our mail. I mailed a letter cost me over ten dollars just a regular old letter for overnight delivery it got there two days later can I get a refund it cost you ten dollars yes it's expensive. never mind mm -hmm. can we expect good or even better mail service under HR 3717 <laughs> you know that that's not something I've analyzed yet we're expecting better mail service next year than this year and we're expecting better mail service every year than the year before. I don't, I don't think that there's anything in this bill that makes mail service to go bad all of a sudden. What Could I add something to that? This bill, and the chairman's recognized this, that, and it expect, this bill expects us to compete. And I'm convinced that the secret to our competing uh, on whatever playing field we're at is being able to control both our costs and improve our quality. Uh, so if that effect comes mm -hmm. out of this bill, I'd say the answer is yes. What will fewer postal employees and privatized personnel and operations mean to mail service and delivery? What will fewer postal employees mean to the security and integrity of mail service? I don't know anything in the bill that says that there would be fewer postal employees. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I, maybe I missed something. Okay. Um, for some time now, you've been calling for a summit with postal labor unions. H.R. 3717 establishes a Presidential Postal Employee Management Commission. <clears throat> Should not postal labor unions be specifically included in this commission? Well, how, how you would make that commission up uh, is, is something that we need to discuss. Uh, the way it is now, it's uh, made up, I think, by two union members, two management members, and three other members uh, appointed I'll tell you how president. it's made up. The commission would have seven members, mm -hmm. two representing large non-postal, non-postal labor organizations, two for management ranks of similar sized private corporations, and two who are well known in the employee management labor mediation and collective bargaining area an additional nonpartisan appointee would serve as chair. Do you agree that uh, labor unions should be, postal unions should be specifically included? Would you support that? that, I, that be I think the out? way it's, it's drawn up would be, be quite all right because I, I think we need to get a unit. We're talking about okay, something for the Okay, never mind. Country. You support it. Mr. Chairman, would you consider putting that in specifically? Excuse me. Either you do or you don't. I didn't say I supported having postal unions in that. What do you support then? I support having large unions in there who also deal with large employers. Because I think what we're, what we're looking at in that commission, uh, if I understand it correctly, is to bring the whole nationwide look at this thing as opposed to just a uh, parochial postal look at it. Right now, we, we are w working with our postal unions a GAO has put a report out that says what we should be doing and we should be having that summit and it's planned to be in August. And we'll be talking Are with our postal unions in August about that. You're opposed to specifically putting postal unions in, on the commission? I haven't really made a decision yet on whether you really should have the commission or not. What I'm saying is that the commission, as it now stands, would not give us a response totally to the, to the labor management situation for, I believe, three years. I may be wrong in that, but I think there's a report that comes out in 18 months and then two other reports six months apart, or something like that. Yeah. Sure, certainly. Uh, let me just say, we, we came forward with this with something in mind, and I think the Postmaster General has defined it reasonably well. 
we were trying to provide an opportunity uh, that really hasn't occurred, to my knowledge, previously to let outside <coughs> Uh, union folks, organized labor folks, outside labor as well as management uh, uh, experts, so-called experts, take an outside in, look at it, and make a report. There's nothing binding about it. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's the best approach to take, but that is the intent. I know hell is paved with such things. Uh, but certainly, as we go forward, if, if there are those who feel that conceptually the commission is a good way to, to start, but they feel there, there are twists and turns that are, and additions or deletions that, that need to be made, we're more than happy to consider those. I don't, and then the Postmaster General doesn't need me to defend it, but I don't think he's particularly enamored with the concept as yet. So to ask him would he support changing it before he even supports doing it may be a little, uh, a little ahead of where he is at this moment. Well, I just want him to think, Mr. Well, Chairman, <laughs> and I think as we go into the 21st century that this country should lead the way in involving the employees who actually make organizations and systems go. In this case, the postal employees. I mean, the whole postal system consists of postal employees. And, and as Mr. Runyon knows, I've been on the committee six years, and I've always argued against plantation-type management, where the workers have no input uh, you know, little input. The workers could tell you how to streamline the post office and how to make it more efficient and how to make it more cost effective if you'd listen to the workers. But when we have that adversarial role of management uh, versus the employees and the postal unions represent the employees, that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's what made this country what it is today. And I would just like to see it spelled out in the bill that that the postal unions are included everywhere here. One final question, Mr. Chairman. Under your leadership, the post office, postal service now employs over 822,000 people. Last week, you were quoted in the Washington Post federal page section as predicting the need for a smaller workforce. Could you explain how this legislation will assist you in reducing the postal service workforce? I was asked um, at that um, meeting, symposium that we had with former postmasters general, what I, my vision was of how many employees would be there, and I said, I think there'll be less. And the reason I think there'll be less is because there are alternate means of moving communications that we now call mail, such as through the internet. Uh, through facts and through other things like that, I think that they will continue to get at our business. I am vitally concerned about the Internet because one of these days, that Internet's been going now for about 20 years, and one of these days it's going to reach terminal velocity and it's going to really cut in, and when it cuts in, we're going to see mail really drop off. And when mail really drops off, the need for as many people as we have will drop off. And so that's just a vision that I've got out there in it, 10 years from now. We're going to have less people. It just, it's just going to be that way. I, I know, unfortunately. Um, we will have less people working all over this country, which will probably put us back in the third world class eventually because you need workers to buy products. But, Mr. Chairman, one thing to you. Um, I wish you would rethink the mailbox product project where non-postage items would be deposited in private <coughs> mailboxes because you really, um, you're taking a chance with any Tom, Dick, or Harry putting things in a mailbox. And you have senior citizens and fixed income people who wait for a social security check. And, you know, they don't want non-postal, any Tom, Dick, or Harry coming to their door going through their mailbox. Right now, the only people who are who are legally allowed to do that are postal employees. So um, I think we need to look at that as a security measure. Well, I appreciate the gentlelady's comments, and I appreciate her coming back and her, her willingness to do that it explains why she was not here when, when we talked about this earlier. Uh, we are concerned about that as well. Okay. And uh, that is why, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, but for, for oh, you, no, no, you please don't apologize because you raise a good point. And, and uh, we are concerned, as I said. 
And uh, we have had testimony before this subcommittee, as the gentlelady is aware, from other postmaster generals of other nations who have open mailbox rules where it has not been a problem. And we felt the test uh, would be a good way to try to assess it. As I mentioned earlier, the Postmaster General and his administration, who are probably not particularly enamored with this either, uh, are given uh, the controls and the authority to structure this test. So uh, as if there is error, it will be on the side of caution, because it's certainly not my interest uh, to see the kind of chaotic situations that the gentlelady very rightly cites. So we're, we're concerned about it, too. And uh, I certainly promise you we'll proceed very cautiously in that Thank area. You. I thank the gentlelady for her comments. Uh, I'd like to recognize now a gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Ehrlich. Welcome. Thank you for being here, sir. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Friend, I just have a, I want to explore one issue with you. And I apologize for being late, and I, I'm needed somewhere else actually right now. But uh, on page three of your statement, with respect to the issue of rate setting, uh, you say providing for flexibility to adjust rates annually if needed is good, et cetera thoughtful, progressive approach to the pricing of public services. Then you go on to say, we feel there are opportunities to simplify still further in this area to set pricing guidelines that are clear from the start. Would you expand on that statement? The, uh, as, as I understand the pricing guidelines, uh, first, uh, GDPPI is, is used as a, as a factor. And then there is uh, an X factor that comes in there that I believe is very subjective. I don't quite understand it. I need to know more about that. Uh, I, I personally believe that we should be held to some indicator that is used in the country as a whole. Uh, all objective standards. Excuse me? You want all, all objective standards, in other words? Okay. Right. They should be objective and not subjective, is, is what I'm saying. Uh, for example, we raised our prices after four years. We didn't raise our prices for four years, and we raised our prices after four years, and we raised them two points below CPI. We thought that was pretty good, and uh, so did our mailers think that was pretty good. CPI is not being used. GDPPI is being used, and, you know, that could well be okay. I just don't understand GDPPI. I know it's used for, for setting rates in, in other industries. So. It might be okay. The X factor, though, is, is a question mark in my mind. I don't quite understand that. I see the possibility of a lot of subjectiveness going into that. And that that's my concern. And you need this in order to uh, budget, obviously, which is, I guess, the last, the last uh, statement that you make. We feel there are opportunities to simplify so that everyone can see, anticipate, and and budget for these pricing guidelines. Uh, yeah, not only our budgets, but people who use the mail need to know the extent to which, it, which that can move. And the X factor, I think, is, uh, would be a little confusing to all of us. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let, let's stay on this point of what your concerns are with respect to the arbitrary, I believe was the first word you used, uh, arbitrary nature of, of the determination of the X factor. Uh, under your current system, when you put in for a rate increase to the, to the PRC, there are nine factors that are used to determine the appropriateness of that rate increase, correct? Yes, sir. I, I have them in front of me. They are such things as, number one, the first, and if we presume that they are in declining order of importance, this would be the most important. The establishment and maintenance of a fair and equitable schedule. That's pretty arbitrary. Uh, number five, the available alternative means of sending and receiving letters and other mail matter at reasonable costs. Who says what is a reasonable cost? Who decides? What, uh, my point, without belaboring it, is that I, th I think any time you have a schedule by which you're guiding a certain process, there has to be, by de almost by definition, certainly from practicality perspective, some arbitrary aspects to it. We have, as you know, or if, if, if you haven't, and I, I don't mean that in a critical way, I, I'm just saying if you haven't had a chance to look at it, six factors. Uh, the level of postal revenues attributable, attributable to the product, 
That, that's pretty definable. I don't, I don't think that's arbitrary. Uh, productivity of the Postal Service and providing postal services. You yourself maintain an internal measurement of productivity. Is that not true? Yes, we do. So that's pretty definable. And that's not to say that the X factor in the name itself is, is funny. I agree. The X files, X factor. But the X factor cannot be more precisely defined, and we're willing to do that. But I don't want the record to reflect an indication that I don't think is either fair or accurate that somehow this is a new sense of arbitrary uh, uh, disposition that heretofore has not occurred. Uh, we're willing to talk about them, but I, I, I don't think this is anything new. And I think if you, if you pick and choose actually the, the measurements that we have defined, six of them, at least four of them, are far more, are far more precise and less arbitrary than those that you're currently under. So in, in, your, in your effort to strive to better focus on this new paradigm we're proposing, uh, I think it's important that you look at those as well. And with that, let me suggest to you, let, f let us for the purposes of this discussion assume this bill is going to pass next, not next, let's say next month. Mm -hmm. uh, give ourselves some time. I'd like very much from you the input as to how to make the X factor better. I'd like to assume, and I know, and oppose it if you will. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I would very much appreciate how you feel the X factor could be more precisely defined, because I don't want this to be an arbitrary process. We're trying to get away from that. So, Well, I, I appreciate uh, that offer, and, and we will uh, supplant the record on that. As a matter of fact, there are several issues uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we would like to have the opportunity to, to supplement the record uh, as we go along in studying this bill. Certainly. Absolutely. Um, if I might, uh, you talk about the re-regulation of your international bail, mail uh, business. Um, it, there are some slight differences, but in reality, the biggest change that we propose is that because we place the international uh, mail into one of the two baskets, uh, that's what we have to deal with here, uh, into the competitive basket, it is thereafter subjected to two qualifications. Uh, the first is that it cover costs, and the second is that it, it makes a reasonable contribution to overhead. And beyond that, you can charge whatever you feel the market will allow, which is what I assume you're doing now. So unless, unless you're pricing international mail now under cost, uh, I, I don't see that that's a, sub, uh, a real substantial change. Well, you're, you're saying that even though it's in a monopoly position, which is where it is for the single letter, uh, single piece letter, I'm, I'm not, I, we, we need to get to single letter later. I'm talking about all other. Oh, well, areas. the other is, is no problem. That's in the competitive arena. But, but I would contend that every piece of international mail is competitive. Right now, that's the way it is. It is competitive. And what this does is to take the single piece letter, uh, the single piece package, and move it out of being competitive and put it into a monopoly position. And we don't think there is a monopoly on international mail because we've got four countries coming in here now taking mail internationally and moving it out. Mm -hmm. We don't have a monopoly on that. And, and this would indicate uh, that we would start to regulate it as if we had a monopoly. So your concern then out of the whole international mail market in which you're dealing at this moment, is that piece that we retain in the monopoly or the non-competitive area. If we were to move that one remaining piece out of non-competitive into competitive, you would no longer be troubled by the... Oh, no, we have no problem with, uh, with monopoly mail or, or with the uh, international mail being in the competitive arena. That's where we think it ought to be. But right now it's in both arenas, and we just don't think it belongs in both arenas. I, if I could add something to that, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the list within the what is now uh, called the non-competitive <coughs> categories, the four baskets, there it's more than international mail. Inter international mail is a totally deregulated product. 
but uh, the, uh, the whole area of, of uh, parcels, there are single piece parcels included in that. There's, uh, there's uh, standard mail, the former advertising mail that's included in that, uh, which have a great deal of competition out there. And, and I, we believe are, are clear candidates to be considered in another area. When you look at, the, at the, the design of the competitive side of this thing, there are checks and balances there, at least if I'm reading this bill correctly. It, it does require us to cover our attributable costs. It does require us to, uh, uh, to make a reasonable contribution to overhead. And it does provide for an audit of that activity uh, as to compliance with that requirement. Uh, now, I'm not sure whether, uh, if, if it requires reasonable, I'm assuming that that also requires that it, there's a corresponding unreasonable uh, amount as well. Mm -hmm. I do believe there's a check there, it's, and there's some reasons to think seriously about uh, being able to push some of that over into the competitive basket. Uh, he, he's bringing up a, a separate thing there under, under parcels, uh, which, um, well, we're far from being monopoly on parcels. We are very much a, minor a minority on parcels, and we need to be able to compete more. I would like to say one more thing about the competitive arena. Um, that does change in the um, international mail, and that is today we can change the price on an international product when we need to change the price, when the market demands it. As I read the bill, we can only change the price one time a year, and I think it has to be on the same day each year. And so that takes away some flexibility that we have now, even in the international mail. So I, I would like to correct myself and say there is a problem uh, with that, because I think that anything that is competitive should be competitive. And competitive means that if, you're con if your competitor changes their prices, and you can change your prices, still meet all of the conditions that you're talking about, then you ought to be able to do that. Now, there's one thing further in the bill. When you say you have to meet all your costs, competitors don't have to do that. Uh, and I think that if you could take on the competitive side, the 12 or 14 percent, whatever that is, and say that that had to break even, that would be better than saying every product has to break even. Because uh, any, any business out there has some products to get their product name in the market that they might sell at a below cost situation. Not everything that, that competitors sell make money, and especially our competitors. So that, that's another aspect that we'd like to study a little bit more and be able to, to supplement the record a little. Well, we, cer we certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, playing as I have in the past devil's advocate, I suspect if some of your competitors were here, they'd say, well, that may be true, but we also pay taxes, we also pay, uh, pay parking tickets, we also pay a lot of things. And I'm not suggesting uh, necessarily that you should, but that is a unique challenge in trying to provide a transition from your current st status to, to a new, more competitive one, uh, that those kinds of issues uh, are not something I don't think we're going to resolve here and so we're trying to trying to sure. balance that uh, balance that back and forth but but on, on the tax situation if we are a break-even company then no taxes are due well you won't be a break-even company under this I hope <laughs> well you know I understand that but we would like to make sure that we keep our postage rates as low as we can well, I want you to do that as well <laughs> Believe me. Um, Mr. Gleiman will, uh, and we need to get him up here uh, very soon because he's been very patient, but he, he talks about in his testimony uh, a provision technically known as Section 601B of Title 39 that allows you to suspend uh, on a case-by-case on a case -case basis uh, uh, the private ex express statutes. Uh, and your monopoly on, on first-class mail. Uh, the concern that he expressed, and, and I think it's important to state this for the record, is that on, in that area where, for example, we narrow the first-class uh, limits from $6 to $2, it might theoretically be possible for you to come into certain markets in the country 
and suspend that, thereby undoing some of the privatization efforts that are attempted in this bill. Now, in previous testimony, uh, you and others have indicated that the Postal Service has always interpreted that section of Title 39 to mean that you only narrow your monopoly, not broaden it. And insofar as I'm aware, that's the only exercise which you have ever put that. Is that is that just luck that you've only used it to narrow it, or is that the official interpretation of the Postal Service of Title 39 that it only is used, Section 601B is only used to narrow the monopoly? Um, the experience has been to narrow, but I, I would like to suggest that it's a question of complicated statutory construction, and if it would be all right, we could submit our answer to you. There, Certainly. there is, it's a debate that has gone on in the postal community, as you are aware, for yeah. 25 years about whether it's a gain or a loss provision and, and authority attached to that. So I'd be glad to supplement on that. And, and we would appreciate that. As you all just heard, uh, we, we just have been buzzed for a vote. Uh, I think this, uh, certainly I'd be happy to yield to the uh, ranking member. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Runyon, uh, going back to Section 401 of H.R. 3717, have you gotten, um, that's allowing you to take money, postal service money and deposit it in other institutions other than the Treasury Department? Have you gotten any proposals from anyone in the banking industry regarding this or recommendations? Uh, Congresswoman, we have um, a pretty extensive banking operation. Uh, right now, we're required to, to deposit all of our funds into uh, uh, into the uh, Postal Service Fund at the Treasury Department of the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, the uh, we do have extensive relationships with something like 5,000 banks out there right now Mr. that help us channel money in. Mr. The, Coughlin, yeah. Have you had any proposals on what to do with the money if H.R. 3717 passed? We have some ideas internally about that. Have you received any proposals from any not banks? Not since this bill was I'm originated. Or no. recommendations from any banks? No. Will the Postal Service continue to use the U.S. Treasury? We will use the, uh, the, the banking system as it's prescribed by this bill uh, well, for this our bill deposits. This bill gives you the discretion. That's right. It does. And we would use that discretion as long as it was to the benefit of the postal customer and the postal rate payer. So, so you, would, you might use the Treasury Department and you might not? Well, we would, using, we would be using federal, federal banks, uh, but it would not necessarily be the Federal Reserve Bank at the Treasury, no. All banks are federal banks, aren't they? No. Oh. Which ones are not? State oh, they're state bank systems. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe you want to put some guidelines in the bill for that. Um, I don't think we want to give people an open hand on what to do with taxpayers' money, do we? With no checks and balances and well, no actually, guidelines. Well, the money we deal with is not taxpayers' money. The money you deal with is taxpayers' money. No, it's ratepayers' money. That's taxpayers. Well, say, <laughs> let's say constituents. Well, let's the, say consumers. The, the, uh, the gentle ladies point is right. not without merit. We certainly don't want to provide a, a totally uh, chaotic situation where there is far more risk than return. Right. And uh, if, yeah. we can, if we can better construct that part of the bill to reflect that, we will. But at the same time, just as local governments and state governments uh, try to invest in, in our pension plans, try to invest in those vehicles that provide a rate of return that is easily above what the Treasury does. We want to be able to provide them that as well because that's money that can help generate uh, in turn monies that go to uh, our mutually uh, important friends of the 800,000 plus employees of the Postal Service. So, Mr. But, Chairman, we're going to have to really look at that because some pension plans go belly up because of um, bad investments. I, I think we're going to have to look at that very carefully. I'd be happy we? to uh, no. look at it to, uh, to the, the gentlelady's satisfaction. That's, that's the promise. Is, I, uh, is the gentlelady complete? Yes, I'm finished. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, will, uh, we will go and vote now. And uh, d with that, let me just thank uh, the uh, members of the first panel, uh, Mr. Rundy, Mr. Coughlin, and Ms. Elanco, for your presence here today. We have, as you, see, uh, as you know, a long way to go. We're going to have an extensive uh, questions for the record to submit to you. 
And uh, in all likelihood, we will see you back here, I hope, at some time in the not too distant future to talk about uh, some evolving issues and questions. Uh, but I do appreciate this very important first step. So if we can stand in recess for about 15 minutes, and upon my return, we'll reconvene and uh, have our second witness, Mr. Uh, Gleiman, join us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let us reconvene uh, here. Let's make it official there. Uh, Mr. Gleiman, welcome. Please, sir, be seated. Uh, although now you just have to stand up and let's administer the oath of office. You were ahead of me on that. You raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to uh, present will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, sir. The record will show that uh, the chairman responded in the affirmative. Uh, thank you. Mr. Gleiman, and thank you all for your patience. As often happens, what I thought was going to be one vote turned into a series. I apologize for that, but I don't control a calendar on the floor, nor am I likely ever to control it, which is fine. So uh, it was beyond our control. But uh, welcome, as I've said earlier, and, and uh, at least at some point, and if they had to go for other business, I certainly understand that. We did have a number, if not all, of your commissioners with you. And we appreciate their attentiveness, and uh, not just in what they do uh, for the commission on a day-by-day -day basis, but for their interest in this process. So with that, let me uh, turn the microphone over to you for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that, and my colleagues yes. do, too. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, good afternoon, or shall I say evening. Uh, I'm accompanied today by my fellow commissioners, Trey LeBlanc, George Haley, and Ed Quick. They have been very involved in our analysis of this legislation, and Chair Vice Chairman LeBlanc has submitted his individual views. I've been asked to keep my remarks to 10 to 12 minutes, and I will endeavor to do so, although some of you know me, and that is a, a task. Uh, in any event, I would request that my prepared statement and that of Commissioner LeBlanc be included in the hearing record. Without objection, without objection both uh, statements shall be entered in the record in their entirety. Mr. Chairman, 15, day, 15 days ago, after months of hearings, I now understand it to be 14 hearings, uh, you introduced H.R. Th HR 3717, the Postal Reform Act of 1996. It would indeed revol revolutionize the way postal rates are set uh, and free the Postal Service to compete in many areas. My purpose today is neither to endorse nor reject the economic premise upon which the legislation is founded, you've developed a new complex structure and I've not fully evaluated the variety of potential ramifications of implementing all of these changes. Hopefully we will have an opportunity to provide additional thoughts in the coming weeks on both the proposed rate making reforms, which are the primary focus of my testimony, and on the many other aspects of H.R. 3717, which we have yet to examine. Mr. Chairman, we may differ on what is best from a public policy standpoint. Ultimately, however, in my role as a regulator, I will work with you to ensure that whatever the legislative output, it is workable with minimal confusion and dislocation. So today, I have some questions and some suggestions intended to clarify and strengthen your bill. Among the matters on which we definitely agree is your commitment to maintaining universal postal service for our citizens at uniform and affordable rates, and especially your emphasis on the need to increase postal service efficiency. These policies should be the bedrock of any postal reform legislation. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and your staff for the courtesies they have shown the Commission. Last week, our staffs met and clarified many matters of concern, including that the Commission's subpoena authority under the bill is intended to extend to its audit responsibilities and to consideration of complaints, and that the Commission will indeed determine both what costs are attributable and the costing methodology employed in reporting and auditing. These are important. Uh, no, I would say they are critical issues, uh, the clarification of which do much to strengthen your bill. 
Following a brief overview of the bill, my prepared testimony addresses the following issues, the responsibilities of the directors, the commission's responsibilities, the baseline case, competitive and non-competitive categories, flexibility, level playing fields, volume discounts, experimental products, the finality of decisions, and price cap regulations more generally. In the interest of time, I will skip over the overview of the bill, how we think it is intended to work, and several other areas, such as the responsibility of the directors and the section on price cap regulation. I would hope, however, that the members and those in the postal community who have been calling for us, calling us for the past several weeks seeking our insight regarding the bill will take the time to read the Commission's entire prepared statement. With respect to the Commission responsibilities, Mr. Chairman, again, I want to thank you for the confidence you've shown and that your bill expresses in the Postal Rate Commission. You've pointed out that the legislation places significant responsibility in the Commission. Section 3723 gives the Commission final decision-making authority in determining price caps. And under Section 3783, the Commission would be given oversight responsibilities, not just with respect to Postal Service rate setting and classification, but also with respect to determining whether the service is meeting its performance goals and, importantly, whether it is meeting the service standards. An additional area of review should be Postal Service productivity, the extent to which the service is meeting reasonable productivity standards or targets it has established. Given the absence of a residual stakeholder, that is, stockholder, if you will, to hold the Postal Service accountable for inefficiencies, some review of postal productivity is warranted. The absence of total factor productivity as a major consideration in postal rate setting and in considering bonuses that might be awarded would permit huge and unwarranted rewards in the face of declining productivity. For example, postal officials are currently touting record profits for the second straight year. And each of these two years where they've had record profits has seen declining productivity. Productivity also declined in 1994. In that year, however, there were no profits. The difference between 94, 95, and 96, in 95, rates and therefore profits were increased. I might add in the way of, uh, of uh, putting things in perspective for the current year and the expected profits that um, it is my understanding that the Postal Service is projecting a total factor productivity for the year of minus 1.7 percent against the alleged profits that they are going to realize. But this matter aside for a moment, our initial reading of the bill suggests that the Commission may need additional guidance as to how Congress intends it to meet its new responsibilities. Determining the adjustment factor, a.k.a. the X factor, the rate-making provisions require the Commission to commence proceedings every five years to establish adjustment factors for the four baskets of products in the non-competitive category. And if I might interject before I go further, sir, there was some discussion earlier about the arbitrary nature of the provisions. I prefer to think of these factors and the factors in the existing law as factors which provide for subjective judgment as opposed to arbitrary consideration. In any event, these adjustment factors coupled with a percentage change in the GDPPI determine the price caps, which apply to all non-competitive postal products. Proposed Section 3723C lists six factors that the Commission must consider in determining appropriate adjustment factors and also requires the Commission to take into account other policies of the Postal Reorganization Act, which would continue in existence. The explanatory material circulated on June the 24th with the draft bill sets forth examples where the adjustment of factor is applied to offset increases in inflation as measured by the GGDPI. This is consistent with practice in other price cap regulatory regimes where the adjustment factor is typically a productivity offset, bringing pressure to bear on management to control costs and operate efficiently. It is also consistent, I might add, with the legislative proposals made by at least two organizations representing major advertising mailers. Proposed Section 3723E2, however, provides that the adjustment factors shall be added to or subtracted from the GDD, 
GDPPI. The second criteria the Commission is to consider in setting adjust the adjustment factor is the cost to the Postal Service of providing the product in question. Is the Commission supposed to set adjustment factors to ensure that the Postal Service may recover all of, it, all of its costs? This is a critical question. Labor costs constitute approximately 82 percent of the total Postal Service cost. H.R. 3717 leaves the existing collective bargaining system intact, and I do not advocate change in this area. However, the facts of the past and the expectations for the future may well clash when an adjusted GDPPI meets an arbitration decision. Attachment B to my prepared statement compares increases in postal labor costs since postal reorganization as measured by the Postal Service's productive hourly wage rate with two inflation factors, the CPIU and your proposed f consideration, the GDPPI, over the same period. Using 1971 as a rate, as a, as a base period, labor costs have increased by 340 percent while GDPPI and CPIU have increased by only 241 percent and 281 percent, respectively. If this trend continues, should the Commission establish factors which are added to the GDPPI, thereby permitting non-competitive postal rates to increase faster than the rate of inflation, or should it establish adjustment factors which are subtracted from the GDPPI, thereby forcing postal management to operate more efficiently and perhaps indirectly bringing substantial pressure to bear on the collective bargaining process. It would appear that the latter is what is contemplated in the bill, since the bill re repeals existing requirements that rates be set to permit the Postal Service to break even. Additional congressional guidance on this question would be helpful. With respect to our audit responsibilities and authority, H.R. 3717 creates a new responsibility for the Commission, annually reviewing the Postal Service data and information to, ensure, to assure compliance with the Postal Service's obligations under law. Fortunately, most data collection systems and cost analysis methodologies, which will be integral to this, are already in existence. The Commission is directed to make a written determination that all rates and fees placed into effect were in compliance with the law. In the non-competitive er rate area, the Commission would be responsible for assuring that the Postal Service does not obtain revenues in excess of the maximum allowable for any product, does not exceed the price cap. For competitive products, compliance with the law means would mean rates would cover attributable costs and make a reasonable contribution as required by the proposed section. 3742B. It is my understanding that the Commission would continue to exercise its current responsibility for determining what costs are attributable to the various types of meal. For the system to work, I view this role as essential. In the past, the Postal Service has contended that even service-specific advertising costs should not be attributed, a position rejected by the Commission. If, for example, the Postal Service could initiate a multi-million dollar advertising campaign to support a new discounted express mail service or a nationwide priority mail service and unilaterally determine that these advertising expenses should not be attributed when evaluating whether the new service covered cost, an annual audit would be meaningless. Similarly, similarly the Commission would be expected to determine if a product made a reasonable contribution to other postal costs. With respect to the reasonableness of contribution to overhead made by Postal Service competitive products, reasonable for a private sector competitor means recovering all costs from his basket of products. The baseline case, which is proposed in Section 3701, requires the establishment of a set of baseline rates and fees. In essence, it provides for what we call the last great omnibus rate case and appears to contemplate a proceeding analogous to those conducted under existing law, although if the case were initiated after enactment of the bill, pricing factors different from those required under existing law would be used to allocate substantial institutional cost. 
This baseline case is critical because it establishes the foundation for establishing price caps for non-competitive products. It will have long-lasting influence on the extent to which the Postal Service can recover institutional or overhead costs from the competitive versus non-competitive products. And I have two primary concerns. Who establishes the revenue requirement in this case and the appropriateness of the new pricing factors for this next and last omnibus rate case? With respect to the revenue requirement, judicial precedents have established that the Postal Service has broad discretion to determine how revenues must be generated by rate, how much revenue must be generated by a rate case, excuse me. The bill appears to complicate, contemplate a price cap system where the regulator would encourage the, the regulated entity to perform efficiently by limiting its ability to increase revenues simply to cover cost. Yet, in the proceeding which sets the baseline for the new system, the regulated entity would have every incentive and indeed virtually unfettered authority to pad its revenue for at least the short term, thereby assuring potential large profit-based bonuses in at least the early years of reform. A related issue is whether the revenue requirement for the baseline should include amounts for contingencies. Proposed Section 3723F provides a mechanism for the Postal Service to request relief from a price cap if it faces, quote, severe financial exigencies, close quote. This is the type of emergency that contingency was attended for, so it seems inappropriate to include an amount for contingency in the baseline case. Another question is how to deal with prior year losses. This convention, established in the late 70s by the Rate Commission, to help the Postal Service retire huge losses it had accumulated earlier in that decade substantially increases the revenue requirement. In the last omnibus rate case, docket number R94-1, a billion dollars above expected operating expenses was allowed for this purpose, for covering and retiring prior year losses. While this convention was justifiable in the context of break-even rate making, inflating rate base rates over expected costs by hundreds of millions of dollars seems inconsistent with the new system, which is designed to limit increases to reflect the index of the economy as a whole. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I think that there's an interesting and perhaps relevant factoid um, here. Inasmuch as H.R. 3717 instills a profit incentive, it is anticipated that uh, profits for the current year that uh, postal management has begun to crow about are coincidentally on the same order as the billion dollars that was built into the last rate case as a cushion for prior year losses. It's not clear to me that one should pat oneself on the back for profits or surpluses realized as a consequence of a cushion built into a rate case. Skipping potential problems with the use of pricing, with the use of pricing factors for the next and last rate case and the baseline case and moving on to an area uh, involving non-competitive and competitive categories, one on which you touched a little earlier today, I would note that while one might expect the term non-competitive to equate with monopoly and competitive to equate with non-monopoly, this appears not to be the case under the bill. The non-competitive product category includes some products which are not subject to the monopoly, such as catalogs and magazines, for which little competition exists, and others, such as addressed saturation mail, which are subject to the monopoly, but, were, but, which for, but for which there is substantial competition. Under the bill, the only constraint on the director's pricing authority for non-competitive products is that prices generally may not exceed the price caps. This is a ceiling. There appears to be no floor. It appears that rates for non-competitive products could be set below cost and that the director's pricing activities in this area are not covered by antitrust law. Thus, it appears the directors could engage in predatory pricing with a non-competitive product such as saturation meal, which in essence is a highly competitive product. Now, I'm not suggesting that they would do this, but if the primary goal of someone at the Postal Service were to increase market share, perhaps they would. It also appears that there may be some anomalies in the competitive category, 
particularly in the special services arena. Many special services, such as post office boxes in rural areas and cert certificates of mailing and delivery, both of which, by the way, are subject of a 330 plus million dollar rate increase case that is currently before the commission, may only be available from the postal service. Is there real competition for these services or are they likely to become competitive cash cows? Moving to flexibility in your bill. The principal feature of the bill is, to in, is increased flexibility for postal management in pricing products. What is the extent of this flexibility? In the competitive category, the only constraint is that the rate must cover direct and indirect costs and make a reasonable contribution towards overhead. In the non-competitive category, generally, the only constraint is the price cap, although in many instances, it appears numerous rate elements could be averaged to, to determine compliance with the caps. Under proposed section 3724, rates for products in the first basket, which is the single piece first class basket, may not be averaged. For the other baskets, as we interpret the bill, rates at the subclass level could not be averaged, but rates at lower levels, for example, rate category and discount category levels, could be averaged. Attachment C my prepared statement attempts to classify existing products as subordinate units not subject to averaging and further subordinate units to use the terms of the bill thereby being subject to averaging. If this is correct, what does it mean? What is the true extent of flexibility that the Postal Service has to price within the market baskets? My prepared statement details several significant changes the Postal Service and or the Commission proposed for periodical class mail over the years, changes that led to contentious litigation and which were ultimately rejected by either the Postal Rate Commission or the Governors. It appears that the bill would allow the Postal Service to implement its own version of almost all of these changes and then some. That is, the Postal Service, following Federal Register notice, could implement a pallet discount, a zoned rate structure for editorial matter, and a bulk discount for high-density publications. Further, it could develop discounts based on other characteristics and could amplify the discounts that already exist. If changes of this kind, of this kind were made, the potential exists to increase the rates for many thousands of publications by 20 to 30 percent or more to offset rate reductions in a relatively few, uh, for relatively few publications by percentages of similar magnitude. For example, the third change discussed above, splitting periodicals into two products, one high density and one low density was a key element in the reclassification proposal for second class mail in the first phase of reclassification. After the Postal Service worked on the proposal for several years, there was a 10 month litigation period before the Commission. More than 40 pieces of testimony focused predominantly on or, or to a substantial degree on this issue. A range of second class mailers and mailer groups undoubtedly spent hundreds of thousands of dollars analyzing the proposal. And then, based on the extensive record, which included considerable attention to testimony from several economists with expertise in the regulatory area, the Commission recommended against the split. Under the bill, the Postal Service, on the basis of short-term notice and limited or no additional review, it appears could proceed with a quantity discount or a density discount to bring about almost the exact same split that it originally proposed in the reclassification case. There would be no need to consult with customers, and it appears there would be no recourse short of a legislative remedy for aggrieved parties. With respect to the level playing field, in the competitive category, does the bill really level the playing field? Antitrust laws are made applicable, but the question is, is this enough? Under the bill, the Postal Service would continue to enjoy other cost advantages that economists might view as artificial in a competitive arena. It would not have to earn profits for investors or pay taxes, even in its competitive activities. Also, and perhaps most importantly, the Postal Service still enjoys the stature of being an entity of the United States government. This gives us an advantage in negotiating with foreign postal administrations over matters such as customs procedures. I think that point was mentioned in the Postmaster General's earlier visit to the committee. Or 
it could negotiate or have a negotiating advantage with other government agencies, as may have been the case when the Postal Service obtained one of the two reserved nationwide blocks of narrow band data transmission frequencies, which it can now use for competitive purposes, while the unreserved blocks, as I understand it, have not been made available to the public, although the telecommunications bill has directed that they be auctioned in a competitive manner. My prepared statement points out several other competitive advantages not earned through greater efficiency, which may enable the Postal Service to displace private competitors in a competitive market, even though it may not be the least cost provider of those services. And if I may talk about volume discounts for a moment, sir. The bill would allow the Postal Service to offer volume discounts as long as all users would be eligible for the same discounts. You have an equal access provision in the section dealing with volume discounts, which is, I think, necessary to promote fairness and, in my view, should be an essential component of any Postal Service program of discounted rates. However, the discretion to set eligibility criteria can result in discrimination, and the discounts themselves deserve careful attention. My prepared statement also points out that without an assessment of respective costs and revenue benefits of the program of discounts for a competitive product, it would be difficult to establish whether the product is covering its cost and making a contribution as the bill contemplates. With respect to experimental products, the bill grants the service broad authority to offer new and modified products on an experimental basis. An experimental product could be offered for up to three years before the service would have to take action to make the competitive the experiment uh, a permanent competitive or non-competitive product. The only substantive limitation on the market test is that it could not generate more than $100 million in revenue in a given year. First, it goes without saying, $100 million is a huge amount of money for most businesses. Gross revenues of this magnitude, if achieved by the Postal Service relative to a single product or service, could seriously disrupt many existing markets. And as an example, I would point out that last year in Netscape, which many of us have become familiar with in recent months, uh, had revenues of only $81 million. And I have a list of about uh, 100 or so New York Stock Exchange listed firms, which also had revenues of less than $100 million uh, during the past year. Um, as you may recall, recently the Commission granted po a Postal Service request to increase flexibility by adopting new rules of procedure. One week ago today, the Commission received a joint motion for reconsideration filed on behalf of diverse parties questioning the potential financial impact of the Commission's action. I cannot comment on the merits of the arguments presented. However, I think the motion which we included uh, as an attachment to the prepared statement uh, gives you a sense of the depth of concern that many in the mailer community have about giving the Postal Service more flexibility uh, in, in uh, certain areas involving experiments. With respect to the finality of decisions, and I am coming down the home stretch, sir, and trying to move quickly, the Commission previously had testified in favor of eliminating multiple layers of review in order to simplify and expedite the process. Uh, my opinion remains that the current system of multiple checks and balances is, in some cases, much, too much of a good thing. At the same time, the bill may go too far in the other direction. H.R. 3717 provides no recourse and no remedy should the Postal Service implement rates which unintentionally or unwittingly destroy a small business or even a whole segment of an industry. Even if the Postal Service rationale for its decision is published in the Federal Reg Register, was completely arbitrary or based on an inaccurate inac factual predicate. There would be no recourse. The director's decisions are final. They're not subject to due administrative review, and they're not subject to judicial review. The complaint procedure also provides no effective remedy. If a complaint's filed, the commission can find it, and the commission finds it justified, the commission cannot order the Postal Service to change an unlawful rate. It can only order the Postal Service to set aside profits for limited purposes. If there are no profits, a complaint case is meaningless. And even if profits exist, the Postal Service may satisfy its obligations by claiming to delay future increases. I mentioned earlier the prospect of predatory pricing 
created by the fact that several postal products in the non-competitive basket are indeed in direct competition with products offered by private enterprises. For example, enhanced carrier route saturation mail competes with newspaper inserts. There is nothing that prevents the Postal Service from exploiting some captive users of one of more subordinate units, further subordinate units, excuse me, in the enhanced carrier route mail area, for example, catalog mailers, in order to cross-subsidize saturation mail's direct competition with daily and weekly newspapers. Again, here, a complaint to the Commission would provide no relief to either the exploited captive mailers or to the private enterprises facing unfair competition. Even if the Commission were to find the complaint justified and find a particular product should be reclassified as competitive, the directors could reject the recommendation and their decision would not be subject to review. I'm not confident that the antitrust laws by themselves will provide a satisfactory solution. While the specter of an adverse treble damage award may restrain stock owning managers of publicly held pro private businesses from unfair competition, postal service managers would be motivated to stretch the edge of the competitive envelope. They would benefit in profitable years and would suffer no personal harm if they inadvertently go too far. An antitrust award against the postal service will only reduce taxpayers' equity. It will not depress future profits which are measured on an accrual basis. Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned earlier, my testimony today, both the shortened version, which may seem somewhat disjointed, and the longer version, which I think hangs together a bit better, uh, were intended to focus primarily on the new pricing mechanism. We will undoubtedly have additional questions and comments and suggestions about this and other aspects of the bill uh, as you proceed. And I look forward to continuing to work with you um, this completes my testimony for today, and I will endeavor to answer any questions that you may have. I thank you, uh, Chairman Gleiman, for attempting to summarize your, uh, I would say, very thoughtful and certainly uh, very thorough statement. Um, conference, sir, um, while, while you were reading our testimony over Fourth of July weekend, we were writing it on Fourth of July. <laughs> There were also were writing rewrites of the original, which I read. And, and I note that there were a few comments that you made in your summary today that weren't in the, either the single first writing or the rewriting. And, and that's okay. not a complaint. It's, it's <laughs> simply that I think that illustrates what uh, I certainly intend will be an ongoing process. Because it, it took us 18 months, roughly, to put this bill together. I do not expect anyone to fully absorb it and to criticize and or to critique it uh, in, in a matter of weeks and, and we will continue to work with you and let me in that regard express appreciation of the entire subcommittee for yours and your staff's uh, cooperation and our efforts to this point. Uh, Thank they've you. been helpful. Let me, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions and then turn over to the other members of the subcommittee who have been enormously patient as well. Uh, let's go back to the question of, uh, let me make another comment first. I, I want to make certain that everyone understands that as I commented to the PMG today, when we propose to create an inspector general's office that is different in that it is for the first time outside the Postal Service, that is not intended to criticize what has occurred prior to this point and certainly not intended to criticize any individual. I would note as well that the changes we are proposing here today is not, are not in any way intended to be a criticism of either the Postal Service or the PRC. I think uh, over the years, the Commission and its members, those of whom I've had the opportunity to work with, have done a more than admirable job given the challenge and the charge that has been placed before them. What we are suggesting here is, as I've called it and others, a new paradigm that by definition would require a new structure and a new process. None of it is intended as a criticism beyond the fact that the times they are changing and, and we're making a suggestion as one way uh, that we could respond to that. Mr. The, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to tell you that um, uh, I don't think any of us at the Rate Commission uh, uh, took the bill as, as a criticism of anything that we've done and uh, I appreciate the 
the work and the thought that went into this. Quite frankly, I was astonished that uh, you could produce a, a proposal that's as sweeping. Uh, you know, questions, concerns, problems, disagreements notwithstanding, it, uh, uh, having worked up here, um, I can tell you that uh, um, I'm just astounded that it, uh, that it could be pulled together, especially in such a contentious area. Um, uh, Mr. Coughlin made a comment earlier, and, and I just want to, to second it. Uh, I think uh, many of the staff at the Commission and the Commissioners had the same experience. Our first reading of the bill was against the backdrop of our years of experience working with the old paradigm, if you will, and, um, and uh, we, we uh, suddenly realized uh, with the uh, I might say the help of some of your staff that we needed to step back and read it not against our experience but against the bill itself as a new starting point. And one last remark is that it is a little known fact that um, it was a one-time PRC employee and subsequent domestic policy advisor to President George Bush, a gentleman by the name of Jim Pinkerton, uh, who we uh, I think all owe the modern day use of the word paradigm but he was at the rate commission for a time. Well, I appreciate that. It's like a painting my grandmother had in her house. When I was young, I noticed that wherever you went in the room, the eyes would follow you, and, and for the first number of years, it scared the hell out of me. But after a while, I got kind of like it. So maybe this will be like that painting, and let's keep staring at it and see if we can't like it a bit here. Uh, let's go back to the word arbitrary. Yes, sir. Uh, you, made, you made comment uh, to the uh, Postmaster General's utilization of that word with respect to the, the uh, six criteria that, w that we set forth. And without getting in too deeply into the specifics, uh, are you concerned that the six that we have defined are indeed arbitrary? Do you think we ought to look beyond those to try to, if, if we were to go this route, and let's for the purposes of this discussion assume we will, if we're going to go along this route, should we accept these six, or do you think there are others? Uh, have you had a chance to look at those in that light and be prepared uh, to react? We've had a chance to look at them, but I really haven't thought of, of the list in that light, whether it should be added to or subtracted from. But again, um, um, I think that the point here is that whatever you put in there, whether it's six factors or nine factors, and whether there's overlap between the old and the new, that uh, the factors represent uh, a requirement that somebody exercise uh, some judgment, uh, not that somebody be arbitrary. There's a serious distinction here, and I think well, it's important uh, to make. I appreciate that. And in, in that regard, let me make the same request of, of you that I made of, of the panel made up of the postal folks, postal service folks. Uh, could you please take a look at those and make suggestions on the assumption that that's the route we may take? as to their efficacy or the need for expansion or deletion or, or however you would respond to them. That would be helpful to us, and particularly as, as we have the opportunity to interface them with what I hope the Postal Service will provide us uh, in that regard as well. And let me use your word about the uh, implementation of judgment to ask my next, next question. You, you, wrote, you raised the question in your testimony, and very appropriately, about the question of costs as it, as it uh, fits into the process of determining um, what, what your new decisions will be on, on, the, on the rate making. Um, we did not define all costs should be re recovered in that fashion for a couple of dis different reasons, not the least of which is we felt if we did that, then in essence what we're doing is, is maintaining the current cost-based rate-making process. It was our intention, rather, to have the Commission be in the position when it is considering all the factors to consider costs. And if they felt given, say, the 80 percent to 85 percent that you, you outline in your testimony as personnel cost as being appropriate to indeed allow it, or any other cost. We felt within the, paradigm, within the, the uh, various standards that we set that the extension of that kind of opportunity to exercise judgment was a reasonable one. Are you, are you suggesting that we shouldn't allow that 
kind of flexibility within the PRC, uh, or are you just saying this may be a problem? I mean, let's say you've got to choose right now. The, the, legisl the Congress either has to strictly define, yes, you recover all costs, or no, you don't, or we give you the power to determine that. And by the way, uh, I think it's important to note in that regard, the X factor, we got to come up with a different name, but the X factor doesn't necessarily have to be a minus. It can be a plus. And if personnel costs were considered by you in your judgment, the, the commission's judgment as a whole, to add, then the X factor would be a plus. How, how would you come out on that question? Flexibility or Congress? Well, uh, I, think, um, I think flexibility is appropriate, but I really do think that there needs to be some additional guidance. I mean, you know, the, the, the big question here is, uh, does Congress want to see under the new scheme, postal rates increasing at faster than the rate of inflation. Congress was silent in the Postal Reorganization Act on that issue, but Congress did say that rates should be set to allow the Postal Service to recover costs and break even. We no longer have break even, and we can either allow them to recover costs and if we are supposed to allow them to recover costs above and beyond the rate of inflation, sir, I would submit that you won't see um, too much increased efficiency in the Postal Service. And quite frankly, um, it raises a question in my mind about whether it makes any sense to make a big change like this. I think the key here is whether the Congress really anticipates a significant increase productivity mm -hmm from the Postal Service? Well, it's a difficult challenge because I think what we envision in this bill is a day where the Postal Service in conjunction with the PRC is given heretofore non-existent flexibility within certain bands, but at the same time we certainly would imagine that most price increases as permitted doesn't necessarily mean that the the Postal Service will exercise them, but most price increases would be at or below the rate of inflation. Uh, but who knows as to what tomorrow may bring. There may be extraordinary circumstances that we have not either experienced in the past or envisioned in the present that would, for some reason, uh, dictate or at least strongly suggest a rate increase opportunity, and it is only an opportunity. Well, that let, exceeds the cost of inflation. I mean, uh, would you agree that that might happen? Yes, sir. And, and, and maybe I can answer the question this way. If that's what you're saying, that you want to really let the Postal Rate Commission um, have that type of authority and that type of responsibility, then I would say I really appreciate your confidence uh, in the Rate Commission, although it is a bit frightening. It's a bit, I'm sorry? It's a bit frightening to me personally to have that much authority and responsibility. I guess I could have taken the bureaucratic way out and said, sure, give it to me, I'll handle it. But it's a lot of authority. Um, and if that's what you intend, um, then I or uh, folks who are at the commission subsequent to uh, my departure in a couple of years will, I'm sure, do their best to, uh, to operate within uh, our understanding of what Congress wanted. Well, I, I don't doubt for a moment that many, particularly uh, at LaFont Plaza, might suggest, yes, giving you this power is frightening. But uh, <laughs> I also think there are those who might say, and I may be amongst them, that the power that you hold today, truly over the entire process, particularly on, on a mandated break-even basis, is not frightening, but substantial. And I, I'm not certain we're, we're changing it, but I don't know as we're really elevating the level one way or another. Let, let me, let me um, just tell you um, very succinctly one difference that comes to mind between the current situation and the situation that would exist under the bill. Under the bill, the governors decide they need X dollars to operate the Postal Service next year. And they come into us and they give us an array of rates and volumes which supposedly will generate that much revenue. 
our ability to modify the revenue requirement to the governors is very limited under current law. It's been adjudicated in the courts. Under your bill, in effect, we would have substantial authority to decide whether we should give the Postal Service, the directors of the Postal Service, what they may think they need to operate. So it would be a substantial increase in authority for us in that regard. Um, and I would hope that if the Postal Service thought it was frightening that they thought about it institutionally and not personally. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, that, that's the difference as I see it, that we really get to uh, mm -hmm. um, take a look at what is now conceptually the revenue requirement uh, if you leave it with either a plus or a minus to the GGDPI. Well, we, we could have put a flat line CPR or GDPPI, uh, but we did feel that the X factor for all of the humor that the name may, may uh, give birth to at this moment uh, was a necessary variable to be realistic. And uh, it's not unprecedented either, uh, as certainly yeah. you know in your, your testimony that you didn't speak about directly, but you wrote about uh, uh, suggests this is if not the, the wave of the future, it's certainly something that's coming into vogue. Doesn't necessarily mean it's right, but well, it's... I, I didn't mean to convey that I thought it had to be one or the other. My point was that as we read it, it could be one or the other, and there are consequences when you can have it one or the other, uh, different pressures that could be brought to bear. And I'm just suggesting to you that we need some um, affirmation of congressional intent in this regard. If the congressional intent is that we should exercise the discretion uh, carefully and that you recognize that it could go either way, well, then so be it. Well, I thank, I thank you for those comments. Uh, we do have a vote again. We were told <laughs> there would be several hours, but I, we do have some time, and I, and I want to yield to the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Owens, who has been very patient. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I uh, came back to hear this testimony because I thought it was very important in view of the fact that this is the first of four hearings on this very uh, sweeping piece of legislation, I, I wanted to try to get a, a, a base as to uh, wh what, what the first and most important question is all about, and that is the relationship between the revenue and the quality of service. I, I'm, like every other member, constantly uh, being uh, approached by my constituents about the quality of, of service, and I li live in a uh, borough of Brooklyn with two and a half million people, and the volume of service is such that whether you're talking about uh, competitive or non-competitive products, or you're talking about the first basket, the second basket, the third basket, the fourth basket, whatever, the volume in all those baskets uh, in the competitive area and non-competitive area is so great until you think that the revenue generated would finance first-class service for us. but. Uh, we've come to the conclusion that we, we get some of the worst service in the country, and uh, there's no relationship between what is being generated in terms of revenue and, and, and the quality of the service. And my, my worry is if we go through the changes recommended by this legislation, are we going to be better off or worse off in terms of the basic uh, problem of enough revenue being generated to keep the service even at the present level? Is the quality likely to go down if you get rid of the competitive products, for example, and uh, a situation like we're going to go from products, uh, mail costing $3 or more, now it's handled by uh, private uh, carriers, you're going to drop that to $2, so more pri private carriers, more ma mail will be handled by private carriers. Uh, that revenue is lost by the, by, by the post office. Will the loss of that function and that revenue improve situation uh, uh, make it worse. If they don't have to worry about those pieces that are going to be taken by the private carriers, is that going to mean they'll have more time to handle the basic service uh, and, and the quality of the basic service that costs less than $2 is going to improve or not? These are questions I have to wrestle with. Uh, I'm sure you don't have any easy answer, but, but my concern is, you know, what is really going to be the impact, in your opinion, of I removing I, large amounts of revenue from the revenue pot that you have now, uh, is it inevitably going to mean that, that, 
there's going to be less to work with and service is going to really go uh, down in, uh, in quality and decrease well, in quality. It's, it's, it's not altogether clear to me that this bill would cost the Postal Service the kind of revenue that the Postmaster General suggests it would. Uh, that's the next question um, I was going to ask. He I would, I would, I, well, it's, 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 it's a predicate to answering your question about service. Um, I would cast my vote with, with the Chairman on this one that these are competitive services and if the Postal Service can compete, then um, it's going to have the business and it's going to have the revenue and if it loses the business, theoretically it ought to be able to shed what are called volume variable costs so that there shouldn't be as, as big an impact as you might think. But you don't think $4 billion said, dollars will be lost? Beg like your that? pardon, sir? I'm sorry, how much? You don't agree with Mr. Runyon's statement that $4 billion of our current business is at risk and the bill is likely to cost $2 billion in the first year alone. You don't agree with that? Uh, I heard those numbers for the first time today and I tried to listen very carefully and understand how he was coming up with them. And the answer is um, I, I don't think that they would be lost if indeed he can compete, as he says he can, with the private sector in these areas. Um, on, Some on the, make the, on the revenue, they can't on the, compete. On, if they can't compete, then they'll lose the business in those areas. But if they lose the business in those areas, they won't have the costs associated with that business. You know, when you have a guy running around with in, in a special vehicle delivering express mail, it costs money. And if you lose the express mail business, you don't have to have the gentleman driving around in the express mail delivery vehicle, so you can shed those costs. Furthermore, um, I think that the bill attempts to establish a nexus between revenues and profits and performance. Uh, if postal managers and postal workers are to be rewarded, and I did read the bonus provision of the bill to cover everybody in the Postal Service except the Postal Rate Commission. Uh, we'd like to, but, lose, but, we'd like to but, lose a large but, number of jobs. They're going to work. They're going to work harder. To, to meet their service standards because service standards are going to be a consideration that we have to take into effect at the end of the year when we do the audit so that they can all get bonuses. So I think that there is an attempt in the bill. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how things are going to work, but I think it's an attempt to move in the right direction. And as I said in my statement, both my prepared and summary statement, I think one of the other factors that needs to be built in and maybe be the main factor, and it would take care of your concern, is that productivity gains should be a major consideration. Because if you have productivity gains and you have to meet service standards, it won't matter what the profits look like. Those employees will work hard and they will deliver the mail in your district. So if they can't compete, they're likely to lose a large number of a large amount of revenue, lose a large number of jobs. But if those jobs that remain in focus on delivering basic service, they might do a better job. Is that what you're saying? It's possible? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, we do need to. I'm getting older. You're not, I know, but I am, and I, I would need the time to get over. There will be a five-minute vote after this 15-minute vote, which is now about seven minutes, so I, I'll say it again. I'll try to be back in 15 minutes, and I appreciate your patience. Is that a possibility for you? I know you may have other commitments. Uh, my only other commitment is to go home and have dinner with my wife and my children, but since my wife is sitting here in the audience, Chances are I'm not going to get dinner no. until I get her home anyway. So I'm more well, than happy. I was going to give her my wife's phone number and they could get together. But uh, <laughs> okay, well we'll be right back. Thank. Okay. That's done. You can. <laughs> Why don't we uh, begin again? Um, let's talk a minute about total factor pro productivity, I believe is the way you described it in your testimony. Y you're correct that, that technically in the annual audits, there is not a direct provision for productivity as a consideration. Uh, on the uh, on the various uh, factors, there is, however, 
amongst the six factors that we've defined for the annual five-year baseline. And number, thir number three, in fact, product one, of the, one of the factors of consideration is productivity of the Postal Service in providing postal services. The reasoning behind that was that productivity is, is not really something that effectively and fairly can be measured over a narrower term, but really is something that has to be trended out. And we felt that the five-year look in that consideration uh, was probably a more balanced way to approach the issue of productivity as a way of requiring uh, the Postal Service to indeed be productive. You obviously don't share that, so uh, I'd like to hear your, your views as to, beyond the five-year, why it is both necessary and, and equally important, workable on a year-by-year -year basis. Well, let, let me start by saying it, it's helpful to understand um, why it appears in one place and not in another, which, which is something that was not um, evident to me on reading the bill or the summary of the bill. And um, I, I will, um, after I leave here today, have to crank your comment that you just made, your explanation uh, in, into my thinking. But um, um, in, in looking uh, at the audit, um, the year-end audit, which is um, what we're going to do uh, to determine whether the, the uh, Postal Service is in full compliance and is going to be the, which in turn is the determining factor uh, in, in whether postal employees uh, can, uh, and officials can receive a bonus. Um, we're asked to look at whether they've met their service standards. We're asked to look at uh, profits, and obviously it's implicit, as you point out, uh, since the factor is, is uh, there uh, for um, the five-year trending under the, uh, under, under the adjustments. Um, it's in there um, in, a, uh, in, in a removed sense. Um, I think uh, that uh, it ought to be more explicit and it ought to be given more importance. The reason I think that it ought to be given more importance is that um, when you're dealing with um, price cap regulation, you, generally uh, you're dealing with uh, firms that are for-profit firms. And there is an incentive for the for-profit firms to do what is necessary to generate a profit for their stakeholders. stakeholders being stockholders. Here, we don't have stockholders, so we substitute postal employees and postal officials. And if you focus too much on profits as opposed to productivity, when you've made this change, uh, since you don't have real stakeholders, uh, as you would in a private company, I think there could be a tendency to game the system somewhat to look toward profits. I pointed out the situation in the past couple of years. Last year, the Postal Service had what they called their largest profit ever, a $1.8 billion surplus. This year, they say that they're going to have a $1 billion surplus. Um, the year before, in 1994, they finished in the red, and my recollection is that after a number of accounting changes, they only finished $900 million in the red. The only difference between one year and the next, the minus 9 and the plus 8 and the plus 1.8 and the plus 1 that we're going to have this year is that they increased rates. Now, I know there are competing interests. They, they're going to compete. They're going to try and capture market share. And that's going to be uh, you know, uh, some, somewhat of a, of a mollifying effect, have a mollifying effect on rates. They aren't going to be able to do whatever they want if they intend to go out and capture market share. But the bill does provide the Postal Service with that latitude. They could go out and try to maximize profits in an area um, 
that was quasi-competitive, if you will, and they could realize substantial um, gains. In the first year, you know, maybe they're going to adjust rates. As I said, the baseline case gives uh, an ample opportunity to pad the revenue requirement and possibly create a situation for, at least in the early years under the new scheme, you, you would have uh, substantial profits based on nothing more than the fact that rates were increased. I don't think people should be rewarded for raising prices when they have a captive or a semi-captive audience. I think people should be rewarded for doing an increasingly better job, and that equates with increased productivity. So, you know, you've heard me say it before. I think uh, we folks in the government get paid to do a job, and we ought to try and do the best job we can, and that um, when we do a good job, it doesn't mean we get bonuses. It means that we earned our salary. No, yes, you have, and, and, I, and I don't necessarily disagree. I, I suppose it goes back to the central challenge of this entire effort, that is, trying to balance a variety of interests and, and a variety of, of directions. Uh, when you talk about incentives for maximizing costs, uh, to pad costs, revenues, rather, uh, that goes back to the issue, well, do we mandate full recovery of costs? Indeed, if we did, then leading up to the mother of all base case, braid cases, then indeed there would be an undeniable incentive. So there, there's an argument against not doing what we discussed earlier. Um, and, and beyond that, you can point to times where, by their measures, productivity went up, and yet service, by most measurements, went down. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not necessarily arguing with you, but I'm not sure there's a direct correlation. Uh, well, I, I don't know, and as I said at the outset, um, your, your explanation would uh, cause me to go back and, and uh, think through this again. Um, as it stands now, uh, based on, on the, you know, the thoughts I've had over the past two weeks since we first got the bill, um, I still feel pretty strongly that uh, it would be um, desirable to have productivity as a specific consideration uh, in, in the year-end audit procedures. Uh, I might also point out that uh, if, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you look at some of the literature uh, in, in this area, while it does talk about having uh, profit-based uh, bonuses, uh, it, it also um, has uh, uh, more limited use of price caps uh, and, and uh, you know, more areas where the Postal Service would have flexibility. But, um, I'll go back and think about it. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. That's all I not only can, but all I should ask. Let's, let's talk for a moment about the antitrust provisions. Yes, sir. There is a uh, decided skepticism in your testimony and your comments that the uh, sanctions implicit in the antitrust laws, particularly the treble damages, are sufficient to cause the uh, cause the Board of Governors, either individually or collectively, if not to do the right thing, then to not, I believe you described it, uh, stretch the process to its limits. Um, why do you think that's insufficient where others assume, and maybe incorrectly so, but others assume the application of it is sufficient in other regulatory structures, number one, and number two, after that, what, if anything, do you think we could do in terms of sanctions against the governors that might provide a greater incentive? Because it seems to me if, if, if we agree that treble damages, the antitrust provisions are insufficient, there's two ways to fix it. We can either give you more oversight, which I think the Postal Service would argue that is tantamount to less flexibility, or, which may be the only way to approach it, or we can beef up the sanctions against the Board of Governors to uh, provide an, a sufficient incentive to act, if not correctly, more appropriately? Well, in as much as I'd like to be on the Board of Governors one of these days, I'm not going to suggest increased sanctions. <laughs> no, all kidding aside, um, <laughs> I don't know that increased sanctions against the, the, the uh, governors or directors, as they would be called uh, under the new uh, uh, bill, um, is, is the key here. Uh, I'm not an expert in antitrust. Um, I know what I know from talking with uh, sure. some folks around the office who know more about it. Long, long time, 
and be very expensive. Uh, the Postal Service, as you pointed out, is a $54, $55 billion entity. Um, its uh, pockets, whether it's got uh, profits or not, are pretty deep on an on a ongoing basis. And um, uh, it's not clear to me that uh, uh, a private firm uh, could go down the tubes long before uh, any, any uh, uh, benefit of an antitrust suit was, uh, was realized. Um, but I, I would ask you to go back and, and take a look at my testimony because I think I raised the, the issue of antitrust not being sufficient in the context of this problem that we're all wrestling with about products that are competitive but are in a non-competitive basket. And, and, and the example I used and, and what um, caused me to say that antitrust might not be sufficient is that you, you can have, uh, for example, uh, saturation mail, which is a, a part of a subclass, an enhanced carrier route subclass, where there can be averaging within that subclass. You could lower those enhanced carrier route, that, excuse me, you could lower those saturation mail rates uh, to well below cost uh, and average in and still get the revenues you want out of the subclass as a whole without exceeding price caps. Uh, this could hurt other people who compete with saturation mailers for advertising dollars. Um, the recourse is that those parties could come to the Rate Commission, could ask the Rate Commission to consider uh, proposing uh, saturation mail be moved to the uh, to, to the um, competitive arena where it would have to be priced above cost uh, plus make a contribution to overhead um, but um, the governors can simply reject that mm -hmm. now, now I I don't know maybe the maybe the key here is uh, that you need to have some review of the governor's decision that, that was a matter that bothered me it bothers me in this instance, and it bothers me in several other instances, not because they can reject what the Rate Commission recommends, but because their decision is final. And, you know, the alternative is to come up here and ask you, for, for someone to come up here and ask you or other members to, to introduce legislation. And, and we all know that the legislative process is, is uh, time consuming and difficult. Uh, and uh, another uh, option is the antitrust suit. Uh, against uh, the postal governors for uh, uh, rejecting, uh, but I'm not sure really that under your bill um, that, that rejection would be a grounds for an antitrust suit. I, I, I think there's kind of a catch-22 mm -hmm. in there. So maybe the real answer is antitrust is okay. It may be enough. Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but if there were some opportunity for review separate and apart from antitrust, whether it's an administrative review or a judicial review, uh, it might uh, it, it might be uh, uh, more uh, acceptable, uh, less likely to do damage, and and that would tie what would it not also into your concerns about the case that you you uh, theorize where a small business goes bankrupt long before any of the relief provisions in the bill could be exercised. So that review provision yeah. might be relief to them as well. Yes. Yes. Um, and and I, I will tell you that. You know, I don't come at this, uh, um, uh, you know, from, from an academic standpoint uh, or trying to think of problems. There are problems that exist right now um, in the postal system. Uh, uh, there is a situation that has existed for several years that you may be aware of uh, with um, um, goods that are mailed out third class and a lot of which are returned because the, yeah. the proposed recipient rejects them. and. Um, part of the business community has been trying to work this out with the Postal Service and uh, doesn't seem to be able to come to accommodation for some reason or another. I don't know exactly why, but um, in the meantime, these businesses, as I understand it from the trade press, are suffering uh, considerably. Um, a similar situation could exist under the bill, and if you don't have postal management or directors who are responsive, you have a situation uh, where, where uh, Many businesses, uh, small and medium-sized businesses, could could go down the drain. Yeah, uh, I am very familiar with that particular issue, and it, it's a point well taken and something we need to look at further. Uh, let me ask you a specific question about something you just mentioned, and then try to apply it on a broader level. You mentioned saturation mail and and the difficulties there, challenges there. 
to what extent does po postal box exclusivity provide a problem for a true competitive field in third class saturation mail? I, I'm afraid um, I have to operate uh, on, on anecdotal information here. Uh, you know, I have heard that uh, one of the big problems is that uh, uh, for alternate delivery uh, of advertising mail in a plastic bag is that people don't like it thrown down on their driveway or stuck on the front door knob uh, and that uh, this has a, uh, an impact on the extent to which alternative delivery businesses can uh, can can line up uh, um, participants uh, but again uh, I, I've not really studied the issue and uh, what I know is anecdotal um, the the open mailbox issue is a tough issue mm. um, and th there just are no easy answers um, do you want uh, do you want people uh, just willy-nilly being o able to open your mailbox and, and, and put materials in there? Uh, or are you concerned about people? I, mean, I, I know it's against the law right now for anybody but a postal employee to open your mailbox and put something in or take something out of it. But in point of fact, people do break the law. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, that things would be any worse if uh, the mailboxes were opened up, except that you might have uh, uh, more advertising mail that someone didn't pay the Postal Service uh, fee to have it put in your mailbox. Um, but on the other hand, uh, things that can't happen now could happen that would be positive. Uh, the Cub Scout troop, for example, now uh, as part of uh, community activity uh, is prohibited from um, delivering Christmas cards within its you know, little area um, because of the mailbox rule. You know, if the mailbox were open, you could have uh, service organizations like that providing services within a community would impact uh, the amount of material going in a mailbox and it would potentially impact the amount of revenue going into postal service coffers. But uh, as you point out, there are other places where this is done and uh, it, it seems to work. I, I just, uh, I've wrestled with uh, more with the uh, aspects of the bill that deal with rate making yep. and haven't really focused on, on the other aspects too much. Fair enough. Let, let's segue into that. Uh, w you, you talked about third class saturation as a, as a product right now that is placed in the non-competitive basket and therefore comes under the provisions of the bill that on the the subclass the sub subclasses within the subclasses uh, I guess what technically are called further rate categories can be averaged uh, so that the subclass it meets its meets its targets, and your concern, as I understand it, is that cer certain of those further rate categories could be greatly damaged in order to uh, to uh, help average out uh, uh, cuts or or uh, uh, pricing uh, decreases for others in the sub subclass. Assuming that that and, and admitting perhaps that that it may be a legitimate problem, how would another factor, for example, a 10 percent cap on differentials amongst the further rate categories, uh, work to assuage your concerns so that you couldn't have uh, a situation such as you cited in your testimony where one could see a 20 to 30 percent price increase to accommodate some kind of uh, cut for another uh, further rate category. Would that work for you? I, I think that's a step in the right direction and, and I don't want to sit here and, and play with numbers or have you play with numbers, but um, uh, a lot would depend on the makeup of the, of the subordinate unit that we would be dealing with within which the averaging could take place. Um, if uh, if, if uh, the preponderance of items in there, uh, pieces in there, were uh, in, in the subgroup that you wanted to lower the rate on, um, the 10 percent cap uh, probably wouldn't make a difference. Remember, these are the non-competitive arenas. They don't have to cover costs. They just can't go over the cap. So um, depending on the makeup of the subordinate unit, how it was weighted um, with different products or sub-products within that uh, um, grouping, it, it might help, it might not help. Um, I would, 
I, I'd, I'd be more than happy to try and sit down uh, with some of the staff at the commission and or with your staff and, and uh, play around with some scenarios and see whether there is a percentage lid that would, uh, you know, that would seem to make a big difference. But the other side of the coin is the under cost, the under costing or under, under cost pricing, if you will, of uh, the other products. Uh, we used saturation mail as the example. I don't want to make uh, um, the devil out of saturation mail. It's an important product and I understand from the people who uh, work in that industry that uh, a lot of folks who receive it like it. I, I get it in my mailbox and I look at it every week, uh, take it up to the house and look at it to see what's in there uh, every week when I get it. But um, the question here has to deal with if you, if you uh, lower the, the, the prices or the rates for those products below cost, regardless of whether you have a 10 percent cap on the other products, uh, you, you still could be in a position where you're guilty of predatory pricing vis-a-vis -vis the, the competitors for that insert type material. Um, that's, that's one that really bothers me. And um, while um, it, it is, I did not mention it, you, you know from my statement that there are postal officials who have indicated uh, what their intentions are given the opportunity with respect to uh, the coming, making the Postal Service the preeminent carrier and, uh, and recipient of advertising dollars. Yes, I read the quote you included and, in your and, testimony. And, and the Postmaster General has spoken here and in other places about his desire to um, increase market share. Well, you know, that's about the same thing. Uh, we are on a very technical level here, and I, I, I'm certain that, that most people uh, don't find this perhaps as compelling as I do, and I, I suspect <laughs> you do. So uh, let me just ask. Not sure what that says for either of us. <laughs> I won't respond for the record on that, but uh, two, two quick questions, and then we have a whole raft of other technical questions that we'd like to submit to you in writing so that we can okay. continue the process. But the first, as I mentioned, and I'm sure you heard, the, the PMG talked about the six products that we move into the competitive area represents about 12 percent of their revenues. You, however, cite 14 percent. Uh, is that of importance to you, or do you think it's just how you cut the cake? Um, it's not of importance, but we're right. <laughs> we, we, just, 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 just for brief explanatory purposes, we took the numbers out of the Postal Service's submission to the Rate okay. Commission. I assume they submitted correct numbers to us. Well, if all we debated in Washington was uh, two percentage points, we'd be far better <laughs> off. But I, I was just wondering if you felt there was a reason for that discrepancy beyond the obvious what you just stated. Uh, the, the last thing. Again, making the assumption that what we're proposing to do here happens. Uh, you have on your staff now a total, total of about 53, 54 people. Is we're, that we're actually down to, uh, well, I think we, uh, we have one new hire, so I think we're up to 50 people now. 50 people? Yeah, from, from um, a low of 49. Okay. Uh, do you think that's a sufficient personnel level to do everything we would ask you to do if it implemented pretty much as it's been proposed here? Would you need more people? If so, have you had a chance to think about what that, what that kick up might mean? We've thought about it a bit. Um, I can't give you a number. Um, I'm pretty sure that we would need, need a slightly different mix of people, but I can tell you that uh, my philosophy is and has been since I got to the Commission uh, to do more with less. I don't believe in building bureaucracies. I believe in uh, increasing productivity. So uh, um, I could see uh, perhaps the need for a handful of people and maybe uh, we could just supplement on a periodic basis with uh, some consultants rather than hiring on full-time staff. But no huge changes one way or another, um, on numbers at least. The, the administrative officer told me this morning that uh, she reminded me that we, we just uh, uh, signed a new lease on the offices that we've been in for the past 10 years. Uh, and I might say that uh, we, we are paying less now than we were paying in the last year of our old lease, which I'm quite proud of. But um, she said that uh, we don't have space for a whole lot of people, so it doesn't matter what I think. Okay. Speaking of not mattering what anyone thinks, I'm pleased now to say you'll be able to go to dinner with your wife, and I'm sure what you, if your marriage is like mine, doesn't make any difference what you think. But uh, uh, let me thank you again for uh, your time and for the patience of everyone in the room here today. Uh, we obviously have a lot of ground left to cover before we even 
take in the uh, initial comments and observations of the many interested parties and organizations that have been so helpful and, and so active in this process. To this point, we have three more hearings scheduled, and I suspect that is the tip of the iceberg. One will be convened next week. Uh, for those of you who would like to join us, we'd love to have you. So uh, again, Chairman, thank you. Uh, have a nice dinner, and everyone else have a nice night, and we'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you, sir. morning, House Republican Leader Richard Armey will be speaking about the congressional agenda. Our live coverage begins at 8 Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2. And on our beginning at 7, Washington Journal. Some of our guests will be Democratic Congressman Floyd Flake of New York and Republican Congressman John Edward Porter of Illinois.